and welcome to another Lazy Review. I'm your host, Lazy Bones, owner and CEO of Lazy Bones Inc. And today I'm joined by a very special guest. Uh, Antic, why don't you introduce yourself to the zero people listening to this who don't know who you are? <laughs> yeah, I guess I will. Uh, I'm Antic, uh, better known as Animated Antic. I just go by Antic for short. I'm an animation reviewer. Most people probably know me best on Twitter. And lately I've been starting to uh, make video reviews on YouTube regarding animated movies. And yeah, I've been basically doing this job for, I'd say, seven years now. I started in 2016. And yeah, just uh, been re- just been a crazy guy that's been reviewing animated movies for seven years. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I-, I still remember, like, I started following you, I think. Be- this was before I deleted my Twitter uh um, I remember, like, I following you since, like, late 2018, like, you would publish, like, your reviews and, like, like give your short, like, vlog thoughts on, like, stuff, like, uh, as soon as you would get out of the theater and then you would you post your reviews on Tuesdays. Yeah, I, I still remember, like, when you're kind of starting off a little bit, but it was still, you're still two years into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it was basically me figuring it out because... I was in high school when I started doing this and I didn't start doing this like full time until 2017. And I think it was around 2018 when I started picking up an audience and I don't know how it happened, but it just happened. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I usually on the show, I like to ask the guest or yeah, uh, you know, whatever, you know, uh, since like you have so meds have you've made so many reviews like uh even going back to like uh on your website or letterboxd and your mm-hmm. current video reviews on youtube what do you think is a good review you would recommend to anyone who hasn't seen your stuff before uh anyone that wants to check me out uh I, i'm very happy with uh in terms of video reviews one video i'm really proud of is my review for nimona uh that was the Netflix movie that came out this year. I adored that movie. It was so great to check it out. I also really recommend checking out one video I'm also really happy with now is my review for Under the Boardwalk, which is the Paramount animation musical that got pretty badly thrown under the bus by the studio. It was pulled from schedule and then they just dropped it on VOD not too long ago. They didn't even get it, give it any promotion. And I went into a lot of detail talking about the, uh, the history leading up to the movie and also just the mess of Paramount's animation division, how it got started, uh, how it was initially going well. And then, you know, the current state it's in leading with movies like Sherlock Gnomes and Wonder Park, Rumble, Sponge on the Run. It, like it's, it's kind of a messy situation. Yeah. And yeah. I, I like talking about, you know, history and also just the movie itself. Cause I, I, I love researching what goes on behind a movie because it, it kind of, explains sometimes whether or not a movie is as good as it could be yeah you know what's funny like uh, i only knew that under the boardwalk came out because of your review actually Uh, (laughs) yeah because like i remember like looking on the wikipedia page for like months on end like when's it coming out like uh is it coming out on streaming but no it just uh got literally thrown under the boardwalk yeah pretty much it got thrown under the boardwalk (laughs) like just yep here it is it's out and i'm I still can't believe they did that because the movie's not great by any means, but it's not awful. I don't know why Paramount thought they didn't have any confidence in it. I mean, I think the only reason they probably did it, and it is a valid reason, Russell Brand is in the movie, and given all that happens, just... Uh, Yeah. Uh, Yeah, yikes. I mean, I I think that no movie like that deserves to be treated like I I I'd argue oh, yeah. that no movie really deserves to be treated that way, even if it's like uh, I, I completely know, agree. Like Batgirl, like uh, apparently test screenings yeah. were awful for it, but hey, still put it out there for someone will enjoy it. I I completely agree. Like if you're gonna if someone made a movie and it's finished, just put it out. I don't feel like a studio should sit on it for so long and then just get it off like it they think it's like ripping off the band-aid or whatever it's just it's really insulting to the people who worked on it and you know we do not need any more tax write-offs obviously i I, i'm obviously we had that whole coyote versus acme debacle which was so frustrating especially knowing that that movie got good screenings at least they're gonna get it out eventually i'm glad warner brothers 
reversed it, but I, I do completely agree. M- movies should not be treated as badly as Under the Boardwalk is treated. It's just, I don't care how good or bad it is. It's just, it's so insulting just to throw it under the bus like that. Yeah, I think every studio is like competing to how how badly they can treat their animated movies from like Disney with Strange World and DreamWorks with uh, Ruby Gilman. Ruby and, Gilman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then there's uh, Paramount. Like they're all just like, how how badly can we treat our animated movies now? <laughs> Uh, yeah, pretty much. It's just, oh boy. <laughs> so there were two movies in particular I was interested in talking about today. One of which mm-hmm. uh, I know, I know, I know you've seen both. One of which is uh, I decided to talk about is the new David Fincher movie, The Killer, because I know that David Fincher is your favorite director, and I remember you did like uh, mention that you did see it. So as if mm-hmm. uh, because he's your favorite director. Like, wait a minute, what am I? Yes. I, ju- I just said that yes. already. What am I thinking? <laughs> Uh, uh so what what are your thoughts on it how did you like the movie as a big fan uh, uh i loved it personally i think this is definitely one of my favorite fincher movies um i i know he was working on this movie for years he actually wanted to make this movie as far back as 2007 it was going to be made at paramount and then it just kind of lapsed into development hell and then he got a deal with netflix and he put it out there and Yeah, I really feel like this is a really great return to form for him because I liked Mank. It was good, but it's not one of his best films. I don't think he's made a bad movie in my eyes, except for Alien 3, but that was not his fault. Uh, Even Alien Alien Cube, I kind of see as a guilty pleasure, personally. Not as like a so bad it's good, but I think there's like elements of quality in there, though. That I I agree. Yeah, I, I, Alien Three definitely has its moments. Alien Cubed. Uh, Alien Cubed. Yeah, that's what most people. Call yeah, it, it has its moment. Yeah, it has its moments. I do completely agree with you. I think there is a great movie in there somewhere. It's just there was so much studio interference that happened with that movie, and when you see the final product, you can kind of tell Fincher was not given a full creative control because even before he got on that movie, it was a huge mess and apparently it, they started scri- uh, filming without a script a finished script at least yes yes they did they actually started filming without a, a finished screenplay and yeah he was really unhappy with the finished film um he's been very outspoken against it he's pretty much disowned it um i mean he was there was a really funny interview he did because he's he is not afraid to say whatever the hell he wants to say about movies and I remember him say, talking about the experience of the movie. He says, I went to Pinewood, and for two and a half years, I was sodomized ritualistically <laughs> making this movie. And then the interview goes, well, I came out, and I actually liked that movie. Fincher just looks at him and goes, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, getting back to the killer, uh, this really feels like him returning back to his darker, grittier elements you would see in movies like Seven and the girl with the dragon tattoo a um, little bit of fight club and uh gone girl in there and it's really interesting because i've seen a lot of people say that this is probably his most self-reflective movie and i kind of agree with that it because this is a movie about a an assassin who basically screws up his job and basically all this insane fault happens from it and you can kind of say that it's kind of a reflective piece on how Fincher views his filmography because ever since he's made Seven in 1995 he, he's since become one of the most acclaimed filmmakers of our time and his movies have definitely had some interesting reappraisal like Seven and Fight Club were not well received back in the day especially yeah, Fight Club Fight that was Club. a very yeah, that was like uh, Roger Ebert didn't even like it when it came out yeah and yeah he did not like it and he, even when he he liked Fincher's work I think he liked all of his movies except for that one in Alien 3 and yeah that movie was really controversial um Rupert Murdoch who owns Fox hated Fight Club and that was what got the president of 20th Century Fox Bill Mechanic fired from the studio because he greenlit that movie and Damn. It, it was this very violent movie apparently which is kind of insane to think about because Fight Club is such an amazing movie. I mean, I'm not saying anything that isn't new, but yeah, that was the first Fincher movie I saw. It. I saw that back in my high school, and not when I was actually in high school. I saw it literally in 
high school, my economics teacher showed it to us. I don't remember anything about that class, but I remember watching that movie. She also showed us Wolf of Wall Street too, <laughs> which is even more insane. <laughs> well, you, well, you certainly had a cool high school uh, teacher. Yeah, I got to see some great movies. So I got, got to see a good Fincher and Scorsese. So there's that. <laughs> but uh, yeah. But yeah, getting back to the killer, this is definitely one of his more interesting slower movies it's not even though it's two hours it's not as long as say uh girl with a dragon tattoo or zodiac but it's really thoughtful and mythological and you can definitely see traces of his entire filmography in this movie like if like if having gone through his entire filmography and loving every single one of his movies and or at least liking liking i don't think panic room benjamin button or mank are his best movies but i still think they're really good and uh, you could definitely see almost a kind of a piece of each of those movies in it. There's one moment in the movie that really reminded me a lot of the game. It, there's a scene where Michael Fassbender returns home, and it, it, it kind of felt like almost an homage to the game. I don't want to spoil what happens in the game for those that have seen it, because that's a movie where you have to go in knowing nothing, and it's just like a complete wild ride from there on out. And it really is such a, it really is such a captivating, intense movie at times. Like this is a movie that after that, during the opening scene where we see him ready to take out this one guy in Paris, he then just hits the gas and never eases up on the tension until the very end of the movie. Yeah, it is kind of insane. Cause like, I think the killer is interesting. Cause like Fincher has done so many movies about like, killers like going back all the way into seven and then he did, did zodiac but he's never done one mm -hmm. where it's like the main and main protagonist of the movie or the person you're following throughout the whole thing it's always like people that are more down to earth and like are trying to find out who it is and uh, yeah I, I guess it's kind yeah. of like leading up to this because like fincher does have a lot of psychological kind of themes to his movies in a way but you know you think mm -hmm. that would lead to a really good character study and i guess like it his whole career has kind of been leading up to this in some kind of way, yeah. It really has been. I mean, this character is very interesting because compared to... Because like you said, every one of his other characters is following the crime. You look at Seven, you look at Zodiac, even Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. Every single one of these characters Arguably Gone Girl are, as well. Yeah, Gone Girl too. I, I was going to get to Gone Girl in a bit, but... The thing that reminds me of Gone Girl is that the killer in this movie reminded me a lot of Amy Dunn because she has this because there's that whole like the scene where we finally learn that Amy framed her alleged um, fra basically framed her alleged disappearance and supposed murder. And it has this entire narration about, you know, cool girl being the cool girl. And it has this great montage edited by James Haygood, who's not James Haygood, excuse me, uh, Kirk Baxter, who's worked with Fincher ever since, I think, uh, Curious Case of Benjamin Button. And it bas it's basically she details her her life with Nick and, and her frustration at his infidelity when she gets to, you know, the forest with all the money and all that and getting ready to frame her disappearance. And that's kind of what this reminds me of, as well as the narration in Fight Club. Like, it definitely feels like him reclaiming elements from his previous movies and putting it into this one movie with writer Andrew Kevin Walker, who he reunites from Seven. Obviously, he's worked with him not just on Seven. He actually directed, a, Fincher directed an episode of Love, Death, and Robots, his first animated project. And Walker also wrote that episode. It's, um, I forgot the name of the episode, but it's about a, it's about a bunch of people on, at sea on a boat. It's really, really good. I still haven't gotten to and, Love, Death, and Robots yet, but I, man, it's like one of those 500 shows I'm supposed to watch, but I have, just haven't gotten to it. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling, because it's hard for me to catch up on TV, too. And, yeah, I want to really highlight just how good the technical craft in this movie is, because this is a movie where Fincher reunites with his common collaborators. Obviously, most people commonly associated him with uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, who have scored every single one of his movies since The Social Network. 
this is definitely one of the more interesting scores. It's not as it's definitely not as obvious as his their scores in Social Network and uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and Gone Girl, but it's really quiet and it has this morbid feeling hanging all over it. It definitely has more of that Gone Girl flair because I remember when I was reading about the music of that movie, Fincher wanted the music in that movie to sound like it came out of a chiropractor's office. <laughs> like, just like this disturbed spa music almost. And that's kind of what this feels like almost. Yeah. Like, it just has this really eerie if not it's kind of relaxing but yet very very eerie yeah it, it, it definitely is a fincher movie through and through but not in a way that's like tiring because like it has that very grimy color palette that we're used to that's kind of like going all the way back to seven basically like a second feature film and mm -hmm. yeah i mean it uh it really is such a well-crafted movie that it does kind of suck even though i'm really glad that like someone like fincher is able to get this far to where he's able to be able to be given this kind of creative control you know from a massive streaming service it kind of sucks that yeah it's not get really given like the theatrical like sort of expansion that it's you know it could it could have potentially had because i feel like this type of movie is best suited for the big screen you know i know i agree i i have some of my best friends saw this movie in theaters and i was so jealous of them because i was like I really want to see this in the theater. It looks amazing. And I remember watching this. I, I remember I watching this on my TV and I kept thinking to myself, this is amazing. I just wish I was seeing it in the theater because I've really grown to love streaming lately because it's just, it, it, it's not fun watching movies, brand new movies in your house because I feel like the theater is just this awe-inspiring environment. You, you just get transported into another world when you're, watching a movie in a theater compared to watching it on your television screen or a tablet screen or whatnot. Oh yeah. I get the same feeling. Theaters. I know they have their negatives, their cons, like an audience mm -hmm. members can be disruptive. Sometimes they're what oh, it yeah. costs like $50 to go to a theater. If you have two kids or something like that and you have to buy all that candy and whatever, but you know, it's like, it's a nice experience though. If you're looking to get the best possible way of like viewing something. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I, I've had bad experiences in the theaters before. Don't get me wrong. Most of it's just audience members. I've had horrible audience members. Sometimes I had, I had a really, really bad one earlier this year when I saw uh, Ruby Gilman, that was, that was that was terrible. But uh, yeah, watching the killer, it really just made me wish I was watching it in the theater. And I know for a fact, Finch is going to be making more movies with Netflix. And I, I'm glad they're giving him full creative control. I mean, at this point, he kind of pretty much earned it after all he's gone through. I mean, you make a movie as good as a social network. I think your status in director territory is pretty much fully cemented. But yeah, it, it really just does stuff that a lot of these movies are going to get contained to this platform. And a lot of people are just not going to be able to experience experience them in this in this theatrical environment, you know? exactly like it is weird that uh like this kind of um because i know that so many like other prolific filmmakers like martin scorsese are like trying to get their movies their his movies viewed on like a bigger like screen you know throughout uh the country to you know get people to go see it that's why uh even mm -hmm. when he made the irishman it was uh distributed by netflix he was he was still trying to secure a theatrical, you know, window, which he did, thankfully, but it was still kind of limited. Thankfully, when he yeah. made Killers, of, Flower, Killers of, of the Flower Moon, though, he got to, he, most people got to see it on the big screen, or those who did see it, those who did watch the movie got to see it uh, on a bigger format. So, you know, that's good for yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. I think it just has to deal with the fact that a lot of these streamers, are being willing to play the, the theatrical game. Apple and Amazon, especially. The only one that's just been really stubborn is Netflix. They're, they're the only ones that are really scared of the theatrical environment for some reason. And I'm baffled why. I mean, they, they know for a fact that this kind of streaming juice is not going to keep them sustainable forever. And I, I got to give credit to Apple and Amazon for at least taking a chance with the theaters. I mean, I got to give Apple credit for putting both napoleon and killers of the flower moon in the theatrical environment and they're both doing 
they both did very, very well for theaters, which is incredible given that they're very large, uh, dramatical pieces. Yeah, that's always good. It is, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, uh, I think the reason why Netflix is so stubborn when it comes to like releasing movies in theaters, I heard, a, I was watching a video yesterday actually on Who Was Killing Cinema by Patrick Willems, I think is, is, is how you pronounce his name. I think, yeah, uh, I he, saw that video. Um, he was like talking about how like the, one of the, like the current CEO of Netflix, you know, never really, Randos. Yeah, yeah, he never really went to the theater as a kid. You know, his family never took him at all. His dad was kind of an addict. So this kid, mm-hmm. so the theater was not really something that was personal to him growing up. So he thought that the watch movies at home sort of format was was best suited for the audience, I guess, is what his mind was thinking. Yeah, that could. Yeah, that does kind of explain a lot. And um... and they probably don't want to give theaters a you know a boost up um, when it means that if it, if it means a few less subscriptions for their service mm-hmm. yeah i yeah it, it, it's just weird it's just weird but uh anyway getting back to the killer um i think one thing that really stands out about this movie apart from how tense it is um the sound design in the movie it it is incredible this is probably some of the best sound design i've seen in the movie in a long time it was done by uh Ren Kleiss, who has worked with Fincher on pretty much every movie he's made up since Seven. So he's been his common collaborator since day one. And he is an incredible sound designer. He's also worked on all of Spike Jones's movies, uh, except for Adaptation. He's been doing... All, he's basically started to become Pixar's sound designer. He's done a handful of other movies since Inside Out. He did Inside the first Inside Out. He did Incredibles 2, Toy Story 4, Soul... Uh, Turning Red, Lightyear. He most recently did Elemental. Amazing sound designer. This is easily some of his best work. It's very gripping. You really get inside this character's head. And I really like how he used the sound design with how with the music by the Smiths. Like, when we get into, like, and I feel like that also has to give a credit to the editing and the cinematography by Eric Metherschmidt, who's been, who's been a Fincher's cinematographer since, uh, working on Mindhunter. He won the Oscar for Mank. And there's a moment in the during the first scene in Paris when he's about to take out that one guy but accidentally shoots the dominatrix. We get this first person shot from the viewpoint of the killer and you can hear the music very audibly. And then when it cuts to this close-up shot of the killer the audio sounds like it's coming out of the headphones. It's so tense because sometimes you're in his head and then sometimes you're out of his head. And it it really grabs your attention because it, it gets you closer to this character and it also puts you at a distance from this character. Oh, for sure. I thought the, I thought the music choices in the movie also fit really well, well, too. Like when he's on the bus or like when he's listening to something like, like when he is, you know, basically trying to um, after someone like it adds so much to the atmosphere, but also the scene as well. There's a lot of great Mm -hmm. subtleties in that department. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. It's just, there's really a lot of attention to detail put into a lot of the technical craft in the movie, which is to be expected for a Fincher movie. Fincher is obviously known to be a massive perfectionist ever since you know, his work on music videos, because before he started directing movies, I think most people know this, he directed music videos for MTV. And it's not like arty music videos, like some of his uh, peers were doing. Like These are like big, prestigious pop music videos for people like Michael Jackson, George Michael, Madonna. Like his, probably his most famous music video is the music video he did for Vogue by Madonna. Like iconic music video. You could definitely see a lot of Mank in that video because with the black and white cinematography and the classic uh, butterfly lighting that was uh, that was uh, made in the 1930s. Just amazing stuff. So obviously, I think his Fincher's always been great with music and his timing, which I think comes back to his music video days, which was in another great video made by Patrick Willems. It was one of his earlier videos, and. You can really see that being put to the test in The Killer, especially with the music choices when you're listening to it, because the way his films are paced and timed, they don't feel slow whatsoever. Like, every single one of them keeps your attention, and I think that has to come back to 
when he was directing music videos because he had to cram a lot of this iconic imagery into these four to five long minute videos and really showcase the power of the artist or in the case of the freedom 90 video by george michael the power of the song because michael famously didn't want to appear in the music video because he got sick of his image built up by the faith album and he and fincher's job was to get these supermodels and show them listening to the song and basically it just highlights you know the power of this music and also deconstructing the faith image that michael had built up in the late 80s just he really knows how to make stuff that grabs your attention based on with the canvas he has and even with the length he has whether it's an hour and 40 minutes or two hours he knows how to grab your attention i mean the social network is a tight two hours and it is flawless filmmaking um i don't know if i said this already in the video i don't think i did but the social network to me is one of my favorite movies it oh, social is Network's a one masterpiece of the best movies of the 2010s it's so good it should have won oh, best picture so good. and of course the academy in their in their poor taste did not give it the award yeah they gave it to tom hooper for the king speech which is a good movie not great it's but good i just don't think it's anywhere as memorable it, or just, yeah it's so not as memorable culturally or impactful or yeah, it's not as memorable or impactful as The Social Network because The Social Network is one of those movies that's like a fine wine movie, you know? Yeah. It was great at the time. It's even better now, especially with how the Facebook rabbit hole unfolded and just the fact that the way social ne- media has changed since then. And also, and also the fact that it is just so slickly crafted. I mean, this is a movie where everybody is firing off on all cylinders, like Fincher's direction, uh, Aaron Sorkin's script, the editing by Ang- Angus Wall and Kirk Baxter, the cinematography by Jeff Cronin with Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross's Oscar-winning score, the acting from Jesse Eisenberg, Andrew, and Garfield. Andrew Garfield. Yeah. A lot of great um, acting in it, yeah. Yeah, just great movie, great movie. Um. Obviously, I feel like when it comes to how this fits in his catalog, I definitely would put it among among my favorites if I have to be brutally honest. And that's saying a lot because I love most of his work. I mean, I, again, the only three movies I think are his lesser movies are uh, Panic Room, which was a po- which was him just making a popcorn movie after uh, Fight Club. Yeah, Benjamin make something Button, that would which appease was, the studios. Yeah, yeah, basically Pease the Studios after Fight Club. And really, and that's also a really fun movie. I mean, amazing performance by Jodie Foster, very young Kristen Stewart. Um, just really fun, atmospheric, tense movie. And then you got Benjamin Button, which I felt like was him trying to do kind of like his own version of Forrest Gump. Uh, Eric Roth, who also wrote Forrest Gump, wrote this movie. Um, and it's then you got Mank, it, which. But it's yeah, really good best. acting. Yeah, really good acting, not one of his best. And then you got Mank, which was a passion project he wanted to do. This was a movie he wanted to make in the late 90s, early 2000s. It was going to be made by Polygram, the studio that made the game. But then Polygram got folded into Universal. And then Fincher's father died. And Fincher's father uh, was the one that wrote Mank. And that one's really good, too. Sleekly crafted. I just, it does, you don't really get inside of Herman Mankiewicz's head as much as you do with the other characters. And... Honestly, when it comes to who was the true writer of Citizen Kane, was it Wells? Was it Mank? I, I, I could, I could honestly care less. <laughs> like, like, I think make Mank. The thing is, though, like I even thought, like uh, about a year after it came out, like I thought, man, it kind of sucks that Fincher made a movie after six years, and like p- people don't really talk about it that much because it's not like a bad movie, right? Because like, no, it's, it's not. A bad it's very movie well made. It's just like. I feel like maybe it's too well made to like the point where it's hard to get emotionally invested, I guess. Yeah. It's one of those movies. Yeah. I can see where you're coming from. It's, it's so slickly made. The technical craft is on display, but the story underneath it just doesn't offer a whole lot to grasp, which is why I was really, really amazed by the killer because this is one where it felt like him returning to his roots, kind of like going from panic room to Zodiac and, you know, Zodiac was basically Fincher's compromise because uh, he was going to make The Black Dahlia, which was uh, initially directed by Brian, De- which was eventually directed by Brian De Palma. And 
uh, The Black Dolly is not a good movie, for the record. I, I love De Palma. That is not one of his best movies. He should never have directed that movie. <laughs> and if you wanted to, and it's funny, when I get back to The Killer, uh, this was based on a graphic novel, and Fincher actually collaborated with the people who wrote the graphic novel version of The Killer, and they actually made a graphic novel adaptation of The Black Dahlia. So if you want to know what Fincher's version of the movie would have looked like, well, we have a graphic novel showing what it looks like. And uh, getting back to The Killer, it really does feel like him getting back to his darker, grittier roots with a very contained story that's very interesting to grasp and also think about with these characters that are basically nameless. I mean... The killer has many aliases, which are named after TV characters, but we don't know his name except that he's just the killer. And also the fact that uh, Tilda Swinton has a really amazing supporting cameo in this movie. I think she she, she really, really steals the show in this movie alongside Fassbender. And she's just called the expert. Like, these are characters that They're very you don't names, know a whole... But it doesn't really matter yeah. that much. You don't, yeah, it doesn't really matter that much because the character we're supposed to focus on is this assassin. And basically what happens is a job goes horribly wrong and then the people that he works with tries to mess with him by uh, uh, hurting his girlfriend and he's basically just getting revenge and tying up all loose ends so no one can talk to him again. Just fixing up all the problems and you can kind of see that getting back to what i was saying earlier how this is a self-reflective you can kind of see that the people he's working with almost being kind of a metaphor for hollywood itself and the studios he's had to work with well that's true yeah uh it, it basically um, is like a it's an it's a compelling revenge thriller kind of like kill bill in a way but you know not mm-hmm. it's not the same thing obviously but uh you know it's it's very interesting a lot of the you know, sequences in which, you know, he's like taking down his, you know, uh, you know, all the murderers or whatever people that, you know, yeah, to, avenge, out to, avenge, to avenge his wife, you know, are, you know, very well done. I thought the only one that was a little tonally weird compared to like the other ones is like the one where he is like basically kind of duking it out with that one guy. Uh, it was a oh, very, you mean the one in well Florida? choreographed scene. My only like little nitpick is that maybe it wasn't as like tense or like uh you know it wasn't as like unnerving as like the other you know scenes that came before. But that's probably obviously to be expected since it's like just them fighting each other and not really like him you know sneaking up and killing him you know. Yeah, yeah, it feels like I can definitely see where you're coming from. I liked that fight scene personally. Oh, I did too. It it, 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 but yeah, you do make a good point that it isn't as tense, but it's still so well shot and choreographed and it really gets you on the edge of your seat, especially wondering whether or not this guy's going to succeed. And of course, uh, there was one moment in the, during that scene, I, I actually was like, Oh my God, that's insane. And it involves the dog. Cause, uh, Oh yeah. Obviously. Yeah. After the dog, after he, uh, kills this one guy the dog wakes up and then it goes into the dog you dorm when the kill is getting out of the house the dog just literally, literally jumps, jumps through out the, door. the door and breaking the <laughs> glass and i was like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> just like wow i did not see that coming i think a lot of those kills i was like oh my god like <laughs> the like the like when tilda swinton is taken out because it's so unexpected and then also the, the I think the first time I really went like that was the one taxi driver in, um, I think it was, I forgot where they went to. It was, uh, there are there a bunch of scenes. They went to New Orleans and then New York and Florida. And uh, yeah, it, it was, I don't it's remember a, it what was country they were at before though. It was like, it, some... was in, it was, I know it was South America. I South America. Was, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me, let me look it up real quick. Uh, I know it was, I know it was somewhere in South America uh yeah the dominican republic right oh okay yeah Yeah. i knew it was somewhere because uh yeah i'd say that like the the first scene i thought was especially was really good uh the only thing that i was like not really like being grabbed by was i just didn't think there was like as much of a motivation during the first scene at least of like uh of like following this character it got there though afterwards when uh when he went to his home and realized that his wife uh was nearly like brutally murdered, right? 
but uh, mm -hmm. so like that's when i was starting to get invested in it everything else about it is very well shot and it's not my favorite fincher film i think i'm more of a, no. a fight club a fight club kind of guy and uh social network. yeah i i yeah, I agree with you. I do think those are better than this. Um, Fight Club. I, think I, is I my do get what you're. I, I do kind of agree where you're coming from, though, because I do think the first scene before the first kill is a bit slow. Because I just was watching it and I was thinking to myself, um, when is it going to get really going? And then once it really gets going, you're on your end of the seat. It, oh, yeah. it, it is a very slow bill in that opening scene where we see him doing his daily activities and talking about mcdonald's and whatnot um i was waiting for uh, he was in france uh, when that took place right i was wondering uh, yeah yeah I, I, I just wanted to know uh if he got a royale with cheese <laughs> yeah i had uh, to say that yeah got, gotta throw in the pulp fiction reference <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah I, I do agree that that social network and fight club are definitely better i'd also throw in you know i'd also throw in maybe uh, seven seven yeah i mean i do think this is i think seven is a lot more interesting andrew kevin walker script than the killer it, it, which is funny because um if you know anything about seven that movie is actually one where fincher actually did have to battle executives and that was to get that famous ending off the ground because... oh i could s definitely see that because like it's pretty dark and like gruesome so not yeah, gruesome I'll, per he, se but like definitely like dark. It's, it's shocking it's dark and shocking here's why Here's how it actually happened, because before Fincher came onto the project, New Line Cinema hated the ending. They hated it, and they fired Andrew Kevin Walker off the movie, and they tried to hire new screenwriters to rewrite the ending, and they give it like a happy ending where Somerset and Mill stopped John Doe, which would have been so lame. And then just by accident, somebody at New Line Cinema ended up sending Fincher the script that was Andrew Kevin Walker's script with that famous ending. And Fincher loved it, especially the ending. And he told New Line Cinema he was interested in directing it. And they realized, oh, shoot, we sent you the wrong script. This is the scripts we want you to read. And he was like, I'm not reading these scripts. This is the good script, guys. Yeah. And he was like, I'm not directing this movie unless he uses the script. And then when Morgan Freeman and Brad Pitt wanted to work on this movie, they stuck with Fincher saying, if you change the ending, we walk away from this project. So basically, that was where the studio went, fine, we'll let you have the ending. We just, we want you guys in the movie. We'll let you keep the ending as a compromise. I mean, it's it's one of the most famous endings ever, so for a reason. It is, and it's one of the best, too. One of the best. Um, any um, any Anything else you want to say? I, I'm tr struggling to think of, like, other stuff, because, like, The Killer, it's good. Uh, I really like it. Uh, it's not my favorite from him, but I think it's a yeah. very well-made movie, and I think it does. It's more of the type of movie I want to see more big studios make, but you know they're. I do too. It's, they're more risk yeah. averse, so like where they're not going to make s smaller, you know, character studies or that kind of thing. That you have to leave that to the A twenty fours and those other mm -hmm. studios. Yeah, I'm really interested to see what he does next after this movie. I don't know what his next project will be. I guess we'll have to wait and see because. I knew he was going to be making the killer after Mank. I knew that for a while. And um, I, I'll, I'll just say this. I really like this movie. I think it is truly great. Um, even though if it, even if it not might be in my top three Finchers compared to like seven and fight club and social network, I, I'd even say that maybe uh, I'd probably even throw in gone girl, maybe, or oh, gone Girl's awesome. probably... I haven't seen it in a while. Yeah. I love I gone girl. It was awesome. Oh, I love Gone Girl. So good. Probably, I, I I love talking to people about that movie because the, the one mo there's one moment in that movie where every time someone sees it, their jaw just drops. They're like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> uh, yeah. It's it's the one scene between Rosamund Pike and Neil Patrick Harris. If you know which scene it is, you know. <laughs> yeah, I I know exactly uh, what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have anything else to say about this movie. I just. Yeah, I love it. It's 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 great. Great movie. If it was on Blu-ray, would you buy it? Oh yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean I'd buy any Fincher movie except maybe Alien Three, but I I, I would buy every Fincher movie. I Tony, think... please give me a panic room Blu-ray. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> I technically own Alien Cube because I own the Alien collection, so I have the all the Alien movies all the way to Covenant, so 
I haven't seen all, I haven't seen any of the sequels besides Aliens and The Cubed. I think that I've only seen the assembly cut of Alien Cube, so it wasn't the theatrical version. I saw yeah, the one that was the version... assembled by editors. Yeah, that's the one that was closer to Fincher's version. We'll never get a true director's cut of Alien 3 because there was so much metal in behind the scenes. But the assembly cut is the closest one we'll get to Fincher's initial vision. And it's way better than the theatrical cut because Ridley's sacrifice in the assembly cut is way better than the theatrical where we actually see that chest burster come out of her and it's, oh, it's so lame. Uh, That sounds (laughs) awful. I haven't seen the theatrical version, but uh, thankfully I don't have to. Yeah. (laughs) Um, all right, so with that said, the reason why I chose The Killer is because I think it would be a really funny pair to have with another movie that I know we both saw, uh, and because mm-hmm. it's like a complete polar opposite, because, you know, like this summer we had the whole Barbenheimer phenomenon, right? Two movies of completely different tones, so I kind of wanted to do yeah. an episode that was kind of like that. So the, other, so, the other, so the other movie I decided to discuss was Disney's Wish. Uh, I know you saw it. Uh, I know you reviewed it. So you clearly have published mm-hmm. your thoughts on that. But I haven't talked about it yet. Or I did in my short letterbox review, but I was very vague on it. So uh, let's start off with you. What did you think of Wish? Okay, so uh, I liked it when I first saw it. I will say this, though. I've definitely soured on it a little bit since I've seen the movie, though. Um, it's good. I think it's a good Disney movie. But it does not achieve its goal of being the 100. It does not fully achieve the goal of being the grand 100 year celebratory movie that they think they made. There's no denying that this movie is a disappointment. It is. It is. Yeah, I don't want to say this movie is like horrible or anything, but I think it's a very bland and messy screenplay. I, Uh, yeah, the script for this movie needed a lot more work. It felt underdeveloped to me. There was a lot of moments in this movie, when I saw this movie, and the more I thought about it, I just kept thinking to myself, this needed a lot more work, you know? This needed a lot more time in the oven. And I've read a lot of articles about the making of the movie since then, and based on... What I saw, there was a New York Times article that came out a few days ago that is about one of the film's directors, Fawn Vera Sunthorn. And it kind of shows a little bit on what happened behind the scenes on that movie. And from what I could tell, this movie did not have this movie's production, which has started to become a pretty alarming trend for Walt Disney Animation Studios' films. Yeah, especially um, like Strange World. I know Frozen 2 had a similar... There was a whole like and, documentary short series about it. Yeah, and, and Raya and the Last Dragon too. That one also had kind of a bumpy production. Um, yeah, because Encanto's the only one since Ralph Breaks the Internet that's really come out unscathed without a messy production and it kind of shows because i think Encanto is like the the sharpest movie they've made since like uh moana in my opinion i think Encanto is a very good movie that you know is more of what i'm looking for from current disney not to say all their recent movies are all terrible or anything but i think like you know ever since like moana i just haven't been the biggest fan of their output i think the only one that uh has really stood out to me as great is in Kanto. I thought Raya was okay. And I think that, uh, you know, um, there's other there's I, elements I, I, of their other movies I can appreciate, but I just can't really say like they're, they're bringing me along like they uh, did probably in the earlier 2010s. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, I loved Raya personally. I think it's great. There's been, I, I, I I've enjoyed every single Disney animation movie since Bolt. The, I'm not, I'm not, as harshly critical on Disney animated movies as most people are, because I could I could see there's effort going into all of them. I I, I can acknowledge they some of them have some serious problems though, especially Wish, which we'll get to in a bit. But um, but I don't feel like they. I do agree that I don't feel like they're. I do feel like their movies are definitely showing this very alarming downward trend, especially between this and strange world because i i was also disappointed by strange world when i first saw it though i kind of have started to get a little bit of more appreciation for it now in the year since i saw it uh i still think that one's a good movie especially compared to wish which has definitely 
definitely gotten a little bit worse more every time I thought about it because again, this is just not the grand movie they thought they made and they marketed it to be. It's, it's sweet and simple, but, and I, I like it for its simplicity, but if you're making a hundred year celebratory movie like this, I, I would expect it to be a little bit bigger. Yeah. It kind of feels like there's not, re- there's not much of a personality or flavor to this movie. I think all the elements are there. Cause like when I saw the trailers, actually, I, I, actually, I was actually kind of getting intrigued though. Cause like, it seemed like it was going in an interesting like direction, but like, I think a lot of that is just kind of surface level though, uh, in terms mm-hmm. of its execution, you know, um, yeah. even it's even down to like its presentation, which I'm glad that they're, you know, ditching a little bit of the like traditional 3d animation with more mixtures of different styles but it doesn't really feel like it is it's, its, own it's, unique it's not thing. it's not going it's not like it's not like fully pushing the envelope like across the spider-verse or mutant mayhem or, or, or even because like it felt like, or, I, felt or like last those, or, I felt like those animation styles fit the genres or stories they were telling it kind of feels just like more of the 3d animation we're used to just with like a slightly different coat of paint mm-hmm yeah, I, I, I mean, when it comes to Wish, animation-wise, I actually like it. it, it I, I do think it should have, I do wish it kind of went a little bit more. But I, I can acknowledge that at least there is some variety with this watercolor look to it. It's there's, obviously there's... trying to... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. It's, obvious, it's obviously trying to harken back to the time Disney used watercolor backgrounds for their traditional animated movies with Snow White and Pinocchio and up to Dumbo and they briefly brought it back from Lilo and Stitch. The reason they switch they the reason they dropped watercolor and they switched to gouache paints for their backgrounds is because if you've ever painted with watercolor, which I had back when I was in art school in high school art classes in high school, it's really hard to use. It's very, very, very delicate and hard to paint in. And I, I like that they at least try to pay homage to those 30s animation backgrounds with this movie it they, they look pretty dazzling in my opinion mm-hmm. yeah i, I can definitely see, that. see it and also but i'm but i'm also just kind of thinking like most of the time because like it's i really like the 2d stuff in it like i think the star looks nice like it feels that feels like yeah to the stylization but but i'm also just kind of thinking well, you know this would just be better as a 2d movie i think i think it's like i think this is kind of mm-hmm. it kind of feels like disney's way of like uh, of like saying, well, we have a 2D movie here, but it's actually not a 2D movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it feels like they were. I know they were thinking about making it 2D, 2D, but they changed their minds on it. it. It felt like they saw the competition. They were like, well, let's try to do what they're doing. You know? Yeah, it, kind and... of, it feels like they they saw like uh, it feels like Bob Iger was sitting down. Uh, watching the Oscars ceremony for 2019, and he saw that Into the Spider Verse beat both Disney movies that year, and he was like, uh, "Off his angry cigars, like we got to make every Disney movie now look like I spots across the Spider Verse." No, I'm just kidding. I <laughs> you know. uh, yeah, I, I hate Bob Iger. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think the reason what like I could tell this movie has been going through a lot because. Um, Disney animation has been in a weird place since 2018. Because uh, this movie got its start in 2018. I I don't know when it got started. It, it it could be when Lassiter was still at the company, but was on his sabbatical. Or it could be when Jennifer Lee fully took over the company. Lee wrote this movie, for the record. And yeah. um, the impression I've gotten from her tenure so far is that there's been a lot of chaotic last minute rushing on their movies, which it's not to say that didn't happen at Disney animation before. There's obviously been a lot of tons of 180 stuff. Like one of the most famous examples was Emperor's New Groove because that movie was a musical comedy and was less of a comedy, more leaning towards musical. It was called Kingdom of the Sun. It oh, was yeah. uh, directed by Lion King co-director Roger Allers. It was not doing in test screenings. And then Mark Dindal was brought on. And it was just totally turned into like a Looney Tunes comedy. But and and, and, and it absolutely, I do too. I love that movie. I think they made the right call with that. And also, also when it comes to other stuff, Zootopia, that's another one that went through something like that. And also 
Frozen, that also had a lot of changes to it. And both of those worked out. Obviously, they won the Oscars. But apart from Raya and Frozen 2, which I did like, I felt like this in Strange World, you can feel that there was a lot of chaos happening in the kitchen. And you got the meal, and it's not bad. It's just not what you would expect from this chef, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, even even going back to Pixar, like, Toy Story 2 was made in, like, less than a year. And that movie, you can't even tell, like, that movie is just so flawless and how it's told and, like, it's mm-hmm. animation, even for 1999. It still looks really good, you know? Yeah, yeah. Toy Story, I mean, I think every, I think it's a common secret now that Toy Story 2 had its entire production thrown out. People talk always talk about the movie being erased, but they don't talk about the fact that, that when that happened, that was the earlier version of the movie before the whole thing was completely redone in nine months. So basically, they actually reset the whole movie twice. So you, that happened the first time, and then they completely did throw out all the story and started again. Luckily, they didn't lose the animation or the sets, so basically all they had to do was just completely rewrite the script. But still, that's it really just goes to show how strong a studio Pixar is because that movie was made in nine months and yeah, Toy Story 2 is a masterpiece. It's one of the best animated films ever made. It's one of the best animated movies of the 90s. And uh, even now, when it comes to the two animation studios owned by Disney, Walt Disney Animation Studios and Pixar, you could, I could tell that Pixar feels like they're doing a lot more nowadays than Disney animation is doing. And I think I think it's because there's just, I don't know what's going on at Disney Animation. I don't think a lot of people do, but it feels like there is something going on with the higher-ups that we don't know about. And um, I, I could tell Pixar's being left alone because ever since Pete Docter took over, I could feel a lot more personality coming into their films we're obviously getting way more original movies yeah. i've loved every single original movie they've made since onward um, oh yeah i mean i think that my favorite pixar movies that came out this decade have all gone straight to disney plus unfortunately but i got to see turning red on the big screen oh that's awesome yeah turning red is one of my favorites too that's my i think that's my second favorite behind soul but yeah um they made some and, great and movies this decade actually i think uh I yeah, think, uh, I, I still think Pixar's doing still solid. I mean, obviously, there's the box office turnaround with Elemental. We'll talk about the box office results with Wish in a bit, because yeah, I, I do have a lot to, to say about that. And um, I feel like Pixar is in a much better place now than Disney Animation is, because, you know, after the Lightyear, after Lightyear flopped horribly last year and Elemental got off to a sluggish start at the box office. There was worries about whether or not Pixar had lost their magic and that audiences, you know, weren't showing up to the movies. But then Elemental had that box office turn around and it became a sleeper hit. And I'm happy now, about that. I didn't love the movie. I'm really but I'm, happy about But I'm glad I'm that, really uh, like, I, I like the movie. Like, uh, like, I give it like a 6 out of 10. That's good for me. But uh, I'm glad that it uh, turned around and got, you know, to a financial financially successful run because like yeah. uh, we don't we don't want like a uh, another big uh flop to hurt like pixar's like uh you know uh you know i guess like a, another stain on their filmography because like there's only so much that can happen to them before you know some, one of the higher ups just uh you know starts going into someone's office and starts yelling or something like that yeah yeah and I, I, I loved Elemental personally. I gave it a nine, and I still stand by that grade. It, I, I, it's one of those movies that I still think is as good. One of the first time I saw it in theaters, and uh, yeah, and also when it comes to Pixar versus Disney Animation, Inside Out two, I've actually seen genuine hype for it. Like I don't, I'm not seeing a lot of skepticism as I've seen for other Pixar movies this decade. There was so much skepticism leading up to Elemental. There was a lot of this. Yeah, a lot of like kind of a lot of uh, gross animosity. I think like I, I feel it's like almost every single one. Like there was onward, kind of got some eh, uh, like when it came out. There yeah, was, like uh, soul was like eh, when it came out. Then turning red was like oh when it came out. You know, and then yeah, that Luca too. People forgot about Luca. That that was a big one too. Oh, did it? Um, I don't remember that. But... Yeah, I remember it. I remember people were throwing a fit about it, saying it was not as good as Pixar's other work. And oh, that's when it came movie, out. And everyone. 
Yeah, because like yeah. the critics were saying, like, uh, I mean, it's solid, but it's not a masterpiece. But like, I can't. I think that's what its goal was. It was charming. And that's uh, what its goal was. Yeah, yeah, it was not trying to be soul. It was trying to be like a smaller scale movie. It was definitely going to be like you know small scale Ghibli, like Totoro or Kiki. You know. Yeah, I really, and that's I really they, like and that's I love it. I love Luca too. Again, I love every Pixar movie this decade. I've definitely soured a little bit on Lightyear, but I still like it. Um, mm. But I think every one of their films is great. Disney Animation, though, I've liked two of their movies. I loved Raya and and Kanto, and now with Strange World and Wish, they're just good. But you could tell they're not what I expect from Disney because it feels like they didn't really flesh out many of the ideas they had. It kind of feels yeah, like it, there's there's an idea there. It doesn't feel like they knew they knew where to go with it though. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I wanted to point out. I when it, bring it back to that New York Times article. I read that article, and apparently there was a lot of story troubles with this movie. And it kind of shows. And, 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 yeah, if you look at the concept art book, people are sharing the concept art online because the star character was supposed to be a shapeshifter, and that was, and then it was turn into the character we know and i loved i liked the star we got but you can't deny when i looked at this book i kept thinking to myself there were a lot of good ideas here they just did not know how to put them into this full movie like it feels like they were taking a lot of these ideas and putting them on a board and they were like how are we going to make this fit into a movie and they just had no idea how to do it and and i think that's especially notable with asha's friends like these seven dwarves characters like it's obvious that they're there is an homage to the seven dwarves from snow white and i like the idea on paper but i pointed this out in my review they just kind of feel like there's regular doofuses though yeah there's just nothing interesting about them except they look and kind of act like the seven dwarves i mean i mean i actually recently found this out not too long ago uh the doc character in this movie her name's dahlia has a disability she's walking around on her crutch and disney actually had a uh disabled actress voice her and disabled storyboard artist tom caldfield worked on scene with her and i love that i'm glad we're getting awesome representation like that That's nice. but there's just not but unfortunately the problem is there's just not a lot of personality in the character you know there isn't there's just it's just it, I, I i love the representation i just feel like if there was anything interesting about this character apart from the fact that she looks like doc you know i, w I would go nuts for it yeah and, and like a lot of the character archetypes of what you of what we've seen before like asha is kind of the the quirky main character who's like nervous and everything like that but is also mm -hmm. like very sweet at heart and then you know even even the king i think like i think that the villain is a very good idea on paper but i think that uh, he they, he wasn't very menacing though, in my opinion. He wasn't like that great villain that I was hoping for because I know that many people yeah. have, have wanted a straightforward villain and that wasn't like a twist or you know the conflict is the villain or something like that or gener generational trauma is the villain or something like that. It's not the <laughs> villain, but uh, yeah. But I think even still, like I think that you know they didn't like uh, I his motivation is there, but he doesn't really like have this like. Uh, on-screen presence that so many of like the iconic villains had in the past like i think that what they could have gone for is sort of like a miguel from across the spider-verse where they made him like they kind of you know positioned him as kind of an antagonist and how uh, and ask the audience themselves like if we should agree or disagree with him and his motives because miguel even though he's like kind of positioned as an antagonist he's not really the villain though it's more of mm -hmm. it's more about the audience uh, and how they decide, uh, you know, uh, whether they agree or disagree with him. And you know, yeah, he can, he you're can completely still, he can right. Still be, uh, he can still be like Asha's foil, but it's just like you know he's like positioned as the villain, even though you know I'd argue that some of the things that he's doing, like earlier on in the movie, you know, are pretty you know are pretty much just stuff that I think most people normal people would do like no regular person would just give out wishes to people and just let them wish forever the, for whatever they want now he's doing it for self selfish reasons obviously but you know i remember even when uh -huh. people were seeing the trailer like there was a lot of like skepticism saying you know this villain doesn't really seem like a villain though like is like his motivation just isn't there though like or it's there but like it's not uh something that most people would disagree with which is kind of a problem
Yeah, I, I definitely can see your point. I, I I liked Magnifico personally, and I think that mainly has to do with Chris Pine because um, regardless on how you feel about the character or not, I think Chris. I think most people could agree Chris Pine is very very good in this movie. He really imbues the evilness. He's obviously loving playing this character, but I do think you make some great points here regarding around this character and how they feel like he's not as morally gray or black and white as I think they wanted him to be because, you know, I, I get what the movie was trying to go for with him being the selfish character. And I do think he's fun as a selfish character, but yeah, like when you look at, you don't know, I think the problem has to do with the fact we don't know what are the other wishes people have. Like some of them are just very harmless wishes, but a lot of them, we don't know what they are so what if they're horrible wishes though like i was thinking that like at the end of the movie because like uh basically asha just gives all the people back their wishes right or like isn't that what happens yeah like everyone gets their wishes yeah back, but like and... what, if, what if one of the citizens just wished for something horrible like uh gen <laughs> mass genocide or something like oh disney <laughs> says that's okay kids <laughs> Oh man, I, I try not to think that because you know it's you know it's a it's a family it's movie, a family movie, movie. Yeah. but yeah, you make some good points because you don't know what these wishes are, and um, I think, and I, I think getting back to what you're saying, I want to get back to that New York Times article, and uh, are, are we just gonna get full on into spoilers with this movie? Oh yeah, I'm um, fine with that. Um, I think uh, it's been, it's been I, out I, for a while, I think, or at least a week. Yeah. Yeah, and I want to, yeah, I want to talk about the ending of this movie because this is another thing I noticed in that New York Times article. The ending, from what I've read, the little snippet, I don't know full much about this ending though, because I think the only people that know are the people who worked on the movie. It was supposed to be darker. That's all I know. And if you watch the final movie, you could tell that this might have been a very last minute change to being softened because there's a moment when Asha's talking with the queen and she's looking at Magnifico's book and it shows this illustration and it looks exactly like, you know, the Male Maleficent's dragon transformation in Sleeping Beauty. And I thought to myself, oh, they're going to make this go really, really crazy. He's going to go like full on devilish, old hat Maleficent ass. And yeah, that would have been happened. cool. Yeah. I feel like and a, it never happened. I feel and like the reason why is because it apparently scared kids in test screenings, and I just kept thinking to myself, "How scary was it, really?" I want to know? know too. Like, because you can have dark Disney like, endings too. Like the 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 ending to the Little Mermaid uh, is actually uh -huh. pretty dark. Yeah, the ending of Little Mermaid. I mean, not the conclusion, and... but like the climax. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what we're talking about. Where Ursula. Giant, turns into this giant, giant kraken, and, and then she gets stabbed by a boat. Sh yeah, impaled by Eric's ship. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of Little Mermaid, there's something I also want to talk about too, because th this was one of my biggest problems I had with the movie that I already talked about in my review, and that. But uh, yeah, it feels like the ending. Like I could tell that the ending still works. It's just you could tell that it was softened because when you look at the, when I thought of that illustration, I read the article, I'm like, yeah, that explains a lot because it felt like they were really wanting to go all the way by having Magnifico go crazy. And it just never fully happened, you know? Yeah. I feel like even with the whole, like uh, him using like the wishes against like all of the uh, citizens or whatever, they could have gone more bonkers with that. Like what if he like, because, like, uh, when he's using, like, the wishes, you know, to cast his, like, magical spell at the end for the whole climax, it doesn't really, like, show, like, what kind of power a lot of those wishes harness, right? Because, like, mm -hmm. what if he just used, like, a bunch of the wishes from those citizens, but used them against them? Like, what if someone, like, wished for a bunch of puppies, but he just made them turn into, like, ferocious beasts or something like that? Just something, like, absurd like that. That would have been fun, I think. Yeah, that could have been fun. Uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the ending of Cinderella 3 where Lady Tremaine got the fairy godmother's wand and just goes nuts with it. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I it, it, it feels like the pieces are in the right place for this movie, and it still worked for me. I, I, I Like I said, I like this movie a little bit more than you, but even I can't deny that I am 
disappointed by this. It's not going to be. It, it it probably will be an. It's probably going to be an honor. I think it is probably going to be an honorable mention on my top five list for this year. But it's it's not going to make my top five. Let me let me just make that perfectly clear. This is not going in my top five. But um, yeah, it feels like it feels like this is a movie that needed a lot more work in the oven. It feels like it was rushed out to make this one hundred year deadline and. It doesn't feel as grand or celebratory, especially when you compare it to Once Upon a Studio, the short film that came out last month, which yeah. I, I'm being back in October because it's now December. Excuse that me, because like I love Once Upon that, a Studio. That felt like the more appropriate 100th anniversary celebration, because I actually thought when I was seeing this movie on like Tuesday, I thought there were, I thought that was going to screen before the movie, but it never did. I guess probably because it already aired on ABC, but... That kind of felt like more of the appropriate like appetizer because they're celebrating their whole hundredth anniversary, and then maybe the movie after that will be like the main course meal. You know, that's kind of what made a lot of these Disney and Pixar movies, you know, special. Uh, you know, you know, when going yeah. to the theater for, and uh, I guess maybe yeah. that's why not as many people are showing up anymore because like it doesn't feel as special anymore. Like the studios aren't making that as special on the big screen in terms of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, you're not wrong. I did get a little bit of an appetizer for when I saw Wish, because I saw it a week, I, I saw it a few days before it came out, before it fully came out, and I got, a, and it came out on Mickey Mouse's 95th anniversary, and Disney played a little snippet in front of it, which was cute. Though I will say this, one thing I did find funny about it, because, funny about it, because I'm a diehard Beatles fan, I don't think people know that, but I, I, I love the Beatles, I know so much about them. Uh, there's a photo of John Lennon in that video and he's wearing a Mickey Mouse shirt and I kind of giggled at it because one of the weirdest Disney slash Beatles facts I know is that the Beatles were going to be in the junk wanted to were going to be in the Jungle Book Disney wanted them as the vultures in the Jungle Book really yeah but the want but they didn't and the reason they w- didn't do it was because of John Lennon wow <laughs> I was it was so funny I and and I, the reason you say it is because he said, we're not going to be in this Mickey Mouse shit. <laughs> and here he is in a Mickey, and here he is in a Mickey Mouse video. I thought that was. <laughs> wow. That's really, that's, that's that was, talk about the irony. Uh, that was kind of ironic. Yeah. Um, I know like it might, it might seem I'm be, being cynical towards this movie, but like, I don't hate it. I think I've just kind of come to the conclusion on it that I just don't think it's bad. I think it's just aggressively mediocre in my opinion, but. Yeah, that seems to be the impression I've gotten from most people. I know, it seems um, like uh, it seems like a lot of it's getting pretty panned. I think on like online, I think uh, you know. It's, yeah, I, it, I, it I, is I'm not going, going well. Even like uh, you know, I don't. I'm not one to idolize like Rotten Tomatoes per se either. But you know, for a site that's usually positive towards like Disney big release, big big Disney movies coming out, like it's getting like pretty low or mediocre, like forty nine, fifty percent. I think I saw it at. And uh, yeah. that's like their lowest since like probably like Chicken Little, I think. <laughs> yeah, it, it's their lowest since Meet the Robinsons because Meet the Robinsons had like a 67 or so. And uh, let me make this clear. This is not one of my top few favorite Disney movies. They've made 62 films. It's definitely in the bottom half rather than the upper half for me. Again, I, I like most Disney movies. There's only like a select few that I wouldn't find myself rewatching again and this is not one of their very worst movies like this is not chicken little this is not home on the range it's not it's not black cauldron you know actually like black cauldron maybe a little better actually personally because i just i like that darker side of disney that we don't see anymore but i see black cauldron again as more of a guilty pleasure it's not a great movie you can see it's production that, problems but i probably see it fair. i probably see it as more like as like a cult classic sort of thing you know like atlantis like that kind of stuff that you don't really see them see from them anymore but i can obviously see why someone would hate it you know uh, yeah I, I i i don't yeah i don't like black cauldron i gave it a five so if you want to know where it fits on my scale i think it's like a mediocre movie um i i, I love it when disney gets dark i i love disney when it gets dark too but it just it felt it, for some reason black cauldron just doesn't work for me because it just doesn't feel right especially compared to hunchback for instance because hunchback is really dark and i love hunchback oh yeah hunchback's awesome they they went they went for the darker stuff but they also had like characters you could relate to or like it had memorable scenes and like imagery and songs and stuff like that yeah yeah and 
like I said, this is not this is not one of their best films. It's not one of their I would not call it one of their very, very worst. Like I'd easily rewatch this over Chicken Little or even most of their films from the package film era. Like this is not like Saludos Amigos or Make My Music or Fun and Fancy Free, you know. Saludos it's Amigos just, is bad. I remember like uh, or not Saludos Amigos. It's the not three bad. Amigos. It's I remember. Uh, I like no. Three Caballeros is the one. You oh, remember. okay. Yeah, yeah. That one's decent. the The first one they made was Saludos Amigos. It's not amazing because it's only forty two minutes long, and it's just a few animated short films, and you don't get a whole lot out of it because it's so short. And I'm not saying Disney movies being short is a bad thing. I mean, I love Dumbo and I love their 2011 Winnie the Pooh, but it just doesn't feel like Saludos Amigos. It felt like. It it, it 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 felt very little, especially compared to Three Caballeros, which you're thinking of. Yeah, the are, 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 you're thinking of the one with Donald, yeah, Jose, the, and Pachito. Yeah, that's the one. Because I remember that, that's going, the the, one. going to Disney as a kid. Like there, there used to be that like ride of the Three uh, Caballeros, like uh, you know, at Epcot. And I remember like going on that ride all the time. And I still go on it sometimes too. So I guess I have that yeah. nostal- nostalgia for it, even though I've never seen the movie actually. <laughs> The movie's actually decent. It's kind of crazy, but it's fun. The Three Caballeros. It's a fun movie. I mean, I mean, the three. I mean, it's Donald, Jose, and Pachito, and they're a lot of fun. Yeah. And, um, yeah, anyway, getting back to this movie, uh, I will say the one thing that did really irritate me, and I did say this in my review, they really went overboard with the references and Easter eggs. I didn't see I mean, that, actually, until, like, maybe the ending, though. Maybe maybe I'm just like maybe it just flew over flew over my head. I expected like something mm-hmm. along the lines of like all the Disney characters coming out of the portal and they just start like doing a Space Jam two. Oh, you thought it was gonna be like their <laughs> legacy or something? Yeah, everyone just like Marvel yeah, and Star Wars I, start popping up. I, I yeah, I can see that. I can see why you would think that. And that would I'm honestly that would be more get... memorable though, because like that <laughs> that would be so funny. Uh, that uh, I, that would have been that would have been way worse, but. Uh... <laughs> I I, I, I kind of got annoyed by how many Easter eggs were in this movie because I'm a massive Disney fan. I know a lot of these animated films inside and out. And I just kept thinking to myself, okay, I get it, you know? Okay, I get it. Like, the one instance that really stood out to me, there's, like, the two big ones. One is the ending, like you said, and there's one where Magnifico is destroying the wishes, and he references Peter, Peter Pan, Pan. I noticed that. And yeah. Mary Poppins and Little Mermaid. I remember when I saw the when he held up the third one, it said "True Love," and then he said "So much for True Love," and I'm like, "Oh, oh, it's oh, that's what I was referencing." Oh. oh, I get it now. I, I guess that line just kind of slipped over my head uh, when I saw. Yeah, it. a lot of my some of the lines slipped over my head, like like the Simon character saying "Long live the king." My friend, one of my friends, got it was a Lion King reference, and I was like, "Oh, that flew over my head. I did not realize that." Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um. And there, they, but, they, there yeah. was a guy who dressed up as Peter Pan at the end. Uh, yeah, that was weird. The the weird the worst one at the end was the Zootopia line. Oh, oh, that was so forced. <laughs> and then and the movie even ended on like fireworks, and one of them was a firework of like three circles around each other, like the Mickey Mouse thing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah that that was that that was not as crazy as the. You know the scene where Star is sprinkling his magic onto Asha, and then Asha raises her, arm, her arms. I I knew this instantly because I have seen this animation so many times, and I've analyzed this movie so much. It's literally referencing the dress transformation from Cinderella. Oh wow! So like they're literally like um, they're basically like compounding the whole movie with Disney references. Yeah, and it was fine at first. Like it was subtle. Like. The font, for instance, and the credits and opening credits, like, it's the font from the opening titles of Snow White. And I was like, oh, that's cute. I like that. And then I didn't mind a lot of the background Easter eggs, like, you know, the poison apple and the Nick the Coast lair. That was cute. But then it just got a little bit way too much when they were starting to quote other lines and then you, you see other characters. I remember when I was leaving the theater and I was like, that. I turned to one of the, I turned to, one of the dads of the families and he's like did you like that movie and he's like yeah i did it was like they put it was like there was a lot of references in that movie and i said oh yeah there were i said oh, that, at least it was a new legacy though <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, uh i guess it's good they didn't go that route but i mean mm-hmm. i think a lot of my problems with the movie though are just like 
it's it just feels like a paper thin story if i'm being honest like a lot of the even like yeah. down to like the emotional stuff like like it's set up like asha is uh you know stepfather is like 100 years old or something like that and, oh like, her, yeah her grandfather, grandfather yeah. yeah and then you know and that's the reason why she wants to get this wish and everything like that for him but it also sets up the fact that that she had a father that passed away when she was young and it kind of yeah they, you're right and they don't do they don't do anything with, with it. that it kind of seems like uh it would have been better if like he was like if she was getting the wish for something that he wanted though because this whole grandfather character doesn't really do anything he's just kind of there to be a uh a plot thread you know what i mean mm-hmm. yeah yeah i mean i like the story for its simplicity like i don't mind it's a simple story but yeah, you are right. There are a lot of plot threads that are just left hanging and they don't get resolved. And and it could be because this movie, they just couldn't figure out how to fully, fully crack this story in time. And they had to do the best they could with what they had in the limited time they got. And again, this really just kind of makes me feel like this is an alarming trend within the studio that they're trying to rush out and quickly crack these stories and make them get to the deadline on time yeah you know? and that kind of hurts that's the products what, i think it does or it, i should say products because real... that makes them sound manufactured but it, i think they're does, projects it, the pro- though. projects that's what i was saying and I, I i think that was really noticeable like and i think it really hurts with this movie more than it does strange world because strange world also had that i don't know if you know this but that movie got its start in 2017, and they had a lot of time. And Don Hall was really working on it. And then Ryan the Last Dragon was hitting some speed bumps, and he was pulled off of Strange World to fix uh, to finish the movie. And then when he got back on Strange World, he had like literally about a year and a half just to finish the movie. And I and they and he hadn't even fully cracked the story yet. And it shows. I think they just need they they need more voices in there. They need you know new directors and that kind of stuff. Because like uh, I don't think you... it's like they need more directors. I just think they need more time. That's the problem. Yeah, that's, they, that's probably true. Yeah. I think their projects are getting spread way too thin. Like they're really. I feel like these move. I feel like they need a lot more time to properly thread out the movies and make them as perfect as they are. Like I think back to when Disney was soaring during the revival era with movies like princess and the frog and tangled and wreck it ralph and frozen and big hero six utopia moana and when i look at those compared to this you could tell that every single one of those movies was like really tight and controlled you could tell that there was they were very properly threaded together and when i look at this i think to myself it's good but you can tell you could it was have kind gone of gone a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, it's rushed. You could have gone a little bit more with it, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess when I guess another thing that didn't annoy me as much, but I thought was just kind of unnecessary was like the goat character. What's his name again? Valentino, right? Yeah, I, I, I actually completely agree. I did not like Valentino at all. I wasn't I, I actually wasn't annoyed by him as much as I thought I would. I was actually more annoyed by I, I wasn't the annoyed folks, by, I think I wasn't as fully annoyed I just the problem was he wasn't given a whole lot of funny things to say you know Yeah he was basically added nothing to the movie though Yeah except I mean except they needed to get Alan Tudyk something to do which yeah. I I'm glad that they made Alan Tudyk like the, the uh, Alan Tudyk their recurring voice actor since Wreck-It Ralph Yeah you know? I mean he's actually and, he's actually a great voice actor too He is and his Patrick Stewart voice is funny for a bit, and then after a while, it's like, okay. My okay. butt found it. <laughs> you know, I actually to you, put that in. Brought to you I, by the Norm of the North writers. <laughs> uh, let's not go that far. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Norm of the North is. Norm of the North was p- made by people who didn't care about animation, and I know that for a fact because some there was a producer on Facebook that was ranting oh, about right. it. Um, yeah. but. Yeah, Valentino was not the best. He's not. He is definitely one of Disney's weakest comic relief characters, especially compared to, you know, when I look at funny. When when we look at the best comic relief characters, I think my favorite. I mean, you, you got to go. I think when you need to look at my favorites. I think one of my favorites is obviously you got the genie and Aladdin. You got Timon and Pumbaa. 
Uh, Mushu is a lot of fun. More recently, you got um, Revival Era. You got Lu- Lewis and Ray and Princess and the Frog. You got um, Olaf and Frozen. Uh, yeah, I mean, even even splat, even the even splat and Strange World. I like splat. He was fun. I think you could have, you could have just had Star as like the, you know, I think he was a better sidekick. I think. I agree. I I love Star. He was cute. I I, I didn't mind Valentino. I just wish he didn't talk. Yeah, you I know? guess they I guess they needed they needed a talkative side character because that's what a lot of the Disney movies have had since like going all the way back to Aladdin. They would have like the the big like uh comic relief like kind of come in uh during the second half of the movie that kind of happened again with like moana with maui and then you had like uh ryan the last dragon so like this is just kind of like mm-hmm. the uh addition to that kind of oh, pantheon yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah and i'll say this i also like susu too i like susu mm-hmm. um but uh yeah I, I mean this is not as common i don't think aladdin started this i mean there was also i mean there was obviously lumiere and cogsworth and beauty and the beast you got scuttle and flounder and little mermaid oh yeah that's um, true although i think they were kind of introduced more like through the uh more in the introduction though i think yeah yeah you are yeah that is a good point um yeah because yeah the valentino and the star characters are definitely more on the lines of genie or timon and pumba you know and um yeah I guess we should also briefly talk about the songs. I don't think we've talked about them a yeah. little bit. There's um, one song I really like. That's the the one that's been heavily marketed. Uh, this wish. Uh, that's, yeah, that that's one's my one. favorite. And um, that's it, the one it's, I really. It's really like. well sung by Ariana DeBose. You can tell she's very talented. And man, it really does really does suck that like even with Ariana DeBose, who's like an Oscar winner now, she won an uh, Oscar for like best supporting actress last year, and like. Even, yeah, even, West Side Story. even she like uh can't really save this movie like from you know bad publicity because like you know back then like you're able to like big stars were able to help sell these kinds of like newer films you know like but we don't really have have that anymore for like you know the star power in hollywood just kind of like you know fading away yeah i i, I mean when it comes to star powers i just i feel like if their voice fits it fits you know i my only problem whenever a celebrity voice actor is put in a movie is if they don't fit the role yeah. or they just stick out like a sore thumb. Like that Garfield or they trailer can't I act. saw with Chris Pratt as Garfield. It sounds so forced. Like it doesn't fit yeah. at all, I don't think. Like I could I like I yeah. I thought he was okay as Mario, but like I listened to him as Garfield, and I just hear Chris Pratt. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I did not mind Chris Pratt and Garfield. I honestly think he fits a little bit more better than Mario. But compared to him in the Lego Movie or Onward, yeah, like yeah. he looks, but he works better as Emmett or Barley, you know, as one of those characters. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I will say this: when it comes to Wish, I didn't talk about this in my review. There was one song in that movie that I really did not like, and that was "I'm a Star," the one that was sung by all the animals. Oh yeah, that one was yeah, that was yucky. That was really overwritten. Like, I remember, I remember hearing that shareholders line. I was like, "Ooh, ooh, that <laughs> that's not a line that should be in a Disney movie, guys." Yeah, I was listening to a lot of the songs like during the movie, like even the one like all the uh, all of Asha's friends and her sing together. Like, I was like, "This song is just kind of stinks." I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah, knowing what I know now is fine. I didn't dislike it as much as you, but I mean, it I was really on the, the star. Movie. Like I don't hate it. Like, no, no, no. I know that. It's just, yeah, I get where you're coming from, though. Yeah, I totally get where you're coming from. Yeah, because I so Cause... wanted to like this movie. I wanted this to be, yeah. like the like the Tangled or Little Mermaid of this generation, where like their last movie, like uh, you know, I know like they had the Black Collision in the late in the mid '80s, and they had their revival or renaissance uh, with Little Mermaid. These same thing kind of happened with like Chicken Little in the 2000s, and then they had like Chicken Little was like their like like their bottom of the barrel like their downward spiral uh-huh. as so to say but then they picked themselves yeah. up with the uh, tangled another big princess movie princess the princess and the frog came out the year before but that didn't pre- perform nearly as well or didn't really yeah and that acclaimed. was because yeah that was probably and yeah princess yeah princess and the frog became the small sleeper head after its theatrical release i actually did see it in theater i did too yeah yeah it it it, it, it didn't do well because of competition like everyone says avatar but 
the fact it really the fact that people saw this there was also a little movie called the squeak wall which uh, uh nice. yeah let's yeah Oof. i still remember even like back then i remember what doug walker said for his like disney December review like how like he thinks like he thought that most people didn't see the movie because of their bias against tandron stuff at the time which i don't know if that's the case though I hope it isn't because I know there is a there's there's a hunger out there for hand drawn theatrical animation. Like last month, uh, at my I, film festival, like the the line for a boy in the heron was like all the way back to the other side of the cinema. Oh, I'm so excited to see that movie. I see that I see that next week. I cannot wait to talk about that movie when I do. Yeah, um, I think there's an audience out there for it. It's just like yeah, there's definitely an audience for it. I think the problem with Princess and the Frog, in my opinion, it's not the fact that it was a hand drawn animated movie. I think people will absolutely go to see a hand drawn animated movie. I don't think it was the fact that people wanted CG and hand drawn. I think that's total, total bullshit. Um, the thing was is that i think it was a i think it was because a the disney banner at the time disney's animation banner was still not as fully trustworthy because again the 2000s were a rough decade for them and also the marketing at the time and like when i look at the two traditional animated movies made after home on the range both of them didn't do well financially because one was because of one i think absolutely could have done well i just feel like it was a matter of bad timing and the other was opening up against one of the biggest blockbusters in history and people were obviously going to look at it and think it was a preschool movie and that was also not going to be a huge success so yeah i i feel like they really gave up they really just thought that they were going to bring it back and they got worried audiences wouldn't show up to it. I think they absolutely would. And I do think that they will eventually bring back traditional animation because uh, I think this movie is going to, I think Wish is going to force them to reinvent. You know, it's, it definitely feels like there's going to be a light switch that's going to go on. They're like, okay, we need to try something new and different to really win back our audiences and again this is not the first time they did it like we obviously talked about them winning them back with little mermaid and princess and the frog but also cinderella for instance because you forget the 40s the 40s were a horrible decade for disney i know that some of their movies like pinocchio and bambi didn't do very well yeah and the reason why was yeah there's there was reasons why and the reason why was easy world war ii yeah because um Pinocchio and uh, Pinocchio and Bambi could have done well. It's just Europe and Asia markets were completely cut off. So there was no money that was, there was not a lot of money being made in the United States as there was with Snow White, because that was the reason Snow White was the massive worldwide phenomenon is because it also got huge boosts in Europe and Asia. And then Fantasia was, Fantasia was a movie that was put in a limited roadshow thing, and that was because of Disney's distributor at the time, RKO, because they did not like Fantasia at all. And then Dumbo was just this smaller movie that did end up, but that was a mod, that was actually a financial success, but that was because it was like a small scale movie with a small budget. And then they had to make all the package films in the 40s because, again, uh, the movies kept flopping and they had to put all these short films together into a full length feature film. And then once the war was over, they decided they had to make a full-length feature film again. And obviously Cinderella saved the studio. And, well, here we are today, and the studio's still around. Mm -hmm. And um, here's how I'm looking at Wish. Because, yes, it is a disappointment. And I do wish it could have been better. I say that I wish (laughs) it could have been better. Uh, I... I liked it, but I, I, I can't deny that I really thought this should have been a better movie. I do think that they will recover from this. When? I don't know. I don't. We don't know what their next film is. Their next movie comes out in 2024. They still have not announced it yet. It could be literally anything. It could be one of the Zootopias. It could be the Zootopia 2. It could be... Frozen 3. Frozen 3, Yeah. Or Frozen Three Part One because I, I'm hearing that it. They really want to make actually, a fourth one. Who knows? Maybe no. Like, it's, oh, go ahead. You know, I'm hearing that the fourth one, it, it, the fourth is a might because they're thinking about splitting it into two parts. Yeah. Uh, but 
I do think they will recover. I do think that because this is not the this is not like Disney because this is this is not as bad as it was in the two thousands where it was really really on hectic times like like Chicken Little was a mess of a movie because that movie was where the executives really got all over it and it obviously shows in the final product because there was just like they were throwing stupid ideas at the movie like we need to make it about aliens okay you need to take out the father daughter bonding thing you need to make the daughter a boy instead because boys are easier to get bullied it's uh, ironic ironic of a studio that is basically that their bread and butter is princess stories that are very good yeah and they think boys get easier targeted than girls she's what do they know and uh oh yeah this movie was so the movie's production was so crazy that Disney execs even tried to get the Affleck duck in the movie. Really? And, oh, that's so Yeah, funny. they tried to throw the Affleck duck, and Mark Dindle was like, no, no, I will take a lot of your ideas, but even I'm not going to do that. It's a shame, and, because I think Mark Dindle has, set, has like, soured on the film since then, because it, like, it wasn't Dindle was not proud of the movie. Yeah, Dindle was not proud of the movie, and I, I feel bad for him, because I don't blame the movie on him oh, at yeah, all. That is either. entire... If there is someone to be blamed for that movie, it's, it's Disney. Disney Animation's president, David Stanton. He's the one I think should be blamed. And Michael Eisner, too. But, uh, yeah, anyway, getting back to I haven't it. seen Chicken Little since I was a young kid. I know I really liked it when I was younger, but I have a feeling <laughs> now yeah. I'm not going to like it so much. <laughs> I rewatched it a few years ago. It just made me feel sad because I could tell there were some good ideas here. It just felt like a messy movie, though, because it's, it's not a very coherent movie because there's two plots and they don't fit together. Like, there's a baseball subplot, and then that's completely dropped and never brought up again, and the alien thing happens, and... Remember remember, yeah, I, remember I, the time when Disney tweeted about uh, Chicken Little's dad uh, being a good father to his kid and, like, everyone <laughs> pounding on it? Oh, yeah. That was so funny. Like, uh, I forget bad. what the motto was, but it said something like, uh, when the sky is falling, your father is there, or something like that. Yeah, Ugh. but... Anyway, getting back to Wish, um, this movie is not doing that well at the box office, yeah. and I'm not surprised. I thought it would do better, actually, because, like... I, I thought it would do a little bit better, but I think once the... I, I knew for a fact that this was the kind of movie I could think to myself, this is the one that's not going to get the kind of good word of mouth that'll push it forward like uh, Elemental did, but... Yeah, it, it, it's really slipping at the box office. Apparently, it had a ninety-two percent drop from last week. Yikes! And this is this was from yesterday. Uh, we're recording this on December first, and I, 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 I think for a fact that this is not going to this is not going to be a finan- a huge financial success. I, I'd be surprised if it made back 200 million dollars i don't think it will i think it's gonna I, be I hate an out, outright that. flop which i i hate to say i don't like the movie very much but like i don't want to see it fail though because like i don't want no, to send I don't a bad either. message to i really Disney. don't either i hate seeing movies bomb especially if i could tell there's good work behind it and i know there's good work behind this movie but i'm not surprised audiences are not showing up for this because i feel like at this point, this is a movie that could have and should have been better, and it it's just not the kind of movie I could see really winning over audiences. And I say this as someone that likes the movie. I, I, I like this movie way more than you do, but even I can't deny that this should have been better. And um, I just think to myself, you know, this is the kind of animated movie that is going to have a weird legacy and I know for but I know for a fact Disney has gone through wars. This is not rock bottom for them. I mean this is not going to be Disney's not going to get kicked off a lot and shut down again like they were in the 80s. This is not like they're in danger of being foreclosed on. It's just a matter of I hope there's just a shake up. I do not want to see people lose their jobs. Yeah, me neither. If Iger actually loses cuts people off from the studio because of this movie i will be genuinely angry he did that earlier this year yeah with yeah with after they announced a bunch of layoffs then they then they try to make up for that by announcing a bunch of sequels oh lord um 
But anyway, getting back to this, I think Disney will recover. When is up for debate? Uh, I don't know what their next movie is. All I'm hoping for is that it's a good movie. You know, that's all I want from a, that's all I want whenever I watch a movie. I just want it to be good. I'm not expecting a masterpiece. I'm just expecting to hopefully like it, you know, and I liked Wish. Could it have been better? Yeah. Do I think Disney, do I think Disney should do better than it? Yeah, absolutely. I like it. I, I absolutely get why people don't, though. I, I totally get why you're not a fan of this movie. I've met plenty of people that were disappointed by it, and I'm not going to lie. I'm disappointed on it. I still stand by my grade. I gave this movie an 8, which is a good grade in my book, but even I'm thinking to myself, this is not one of my highest 8s I would give. It's... Uh, Teetering on a 7. It, it, yeah, it's it's definitely more towards low 8, high 7, when I think about it, you know? Yeah. It's around there. Um, I don't think it's, like, an awful movie, right? Like, I don't, no, like it's, it's not, not awful. Yeah, because, like, I just think, like, but it is, maybe maybe, it, maybe in some ways that's its worst crime, though, because it's not, it's, it's, it's the whole celebration of Disney's 100, and it's not amazing, nor is it terrible. It's just kind of in the middle it's it's just there yeah it's just there it it's good but for a movie that's supposed to be this big it's it is disappointing and i hate saying that because i love disney and i do like this movie but yeah there's no other way to say it wish is a disappointment Mm -hmm. i don't want this to like uh i remember a few months ago it was when uh the ceo of paramount or it was brian robbins who said he didn't want to risk like, uh, you know, green lighting original yeah. IP for their animation output because, you know, if Disney or uh-huh. Pixar can't get butts in seats, then why, why can't, uh, then how can they, I don't want this to send the bad, a bad message to other studios to only solely rely on pre-existing franchises to get people in seats. Not to say like they can't be good though. I mean, I loved, uh, the Spider-Verse movies, the recent Puss in Boots I thought was great. Uh, I know the recent TMNT movie was also very popular. I just want mm-hmm. a bit of both, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I completely agree where you're coming from. I don't mind IP movies as long as they're good. I just, I, I, I think there needs to be, we need original content out there. And I'm glad Disney is still putting out original content. And I know for a fact they and Pixar will. I mean, Disney's less of a sequel studio than Pixar. Disney's only made like four sequels they've only made like four sequels you know fantasia 2000 winnie the pooh ralph ricks the internet and frozen 2 those are the only sequels they've made so far which is impressive for a movie studio that's made 62 animated films yeah that really is impressive i i i I, and i want to really re-emphasize how moronic brian robbins quote was because he said this in june or maybe July I think it was August, actually. of this year. Oh, it was August. It was, I know it was around the time Mutant Mayhem was coming out. And it was ridiculous he said that because he was pointing to, you know, Elemental, especially considering, and it's even more ridiculous because Elemental became this. It, it, it made it about well. $500 million. It, it made $500 million Off on a terrible opening. million budget. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty impressive. And I think it, it did well because of like international markets too, like South Korea, uh, you know, uh, aided. Yeah, up. they really love this movie. Yeah, it really makes sense because I know that I... the director is uh, has you know Korean heritage and that kind of thing, so it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, they really clicked with this movie, and I could see why. I, I, I loved Elemental personally. I think that's a great movie, and I really, I like, like compared to Wish, like Elemental is so much better because it just feels a lot more properly thought out. The only thing I did not like about that movie was that whole Firetown conflict with the leak. Like, I felt like they, there could have been something a little bit better put in its place. It was not as strong as the character bonding moments between Ember and Wade, which were really, really strongly written and cute, especially considering that it was kind of doing a lot of these interesting ways of telling the story about a kid that doesn't want their parents profession compared to something like space jam new legacy where it opens (laughs) up with them being like oh i don't want to do this dad and there's this whole thing about it and that in elemental ember thinks she wants the shop and then ember thinks she wants the shop and then she comes to the conclusion she's like i don't want it and then she tells him about it and she he's like 
I don't mind. You were all, you were always my dream, you know? And I'm like, yes, I love good writing like this. Yeah. Whereas when I look at Wish, it's like, there's plenty of things I've been like, eh, this could have been better. This could have been better. This could have been better. You know, it's like, I, it's like me with a notepad, just scribbling on sticky notes and just sticking them onto the bulletin board. Like, uh, just fix this, make this bigger, make this better, you know, just, there's a lot of notes I would have given for Wish compared to Elemental. And you know what, you know, what's one thing I just, I just, I just, you know, thought of what is, um, one plot point in the movie that kind of, that kind of grinds my gears like that one doofus character, right? He becomes the apprentice to King Magnifico, right? But like, yeah, he just kind of betrays oh, the all the characters Ch- all of a sudden for like what? Yeah, the Simon character. Yeah, Simon. Yeah, because yeah. like he just becomes the apprentice. Like for what though? Um, I mean, it, it would have made more sense if maybe it, he was under his spell or something like that. That would have been kind of cool, you know? I feel like that was what they were implying, but it was never really shown. Again, I just has to go to tell you that I think there was they didn't really fully fully flesh out the story as much as i think they should and he was and he was forgiven uh, so easily at the end too like the, the yeah like even that, even though you literally just like threw us under the bus and like you tried to and you helped uh the king and like almost destroying the entire world i guess we forgive you <laughs> yeah it yeah there's there like there the more i thought think about this movie i still like it but the more i think about it i'm like there are just things i'm like wait there's just things about this that just they need a lot more work. It really, I, I saw this movie on November 18th. That was about three weeks ago. And it's really soured since then with me because I still like it. I don't think it's a bad movie, but yeah, I just can't get past the point that I think that this is not as grand as it could have been. And I think it's probably because this was not as fully fleshed out in the oven as it could be. And I hate saying that because I love Disney animation and I think they are one of the best studios working around. I've loved a lot of their movies. I will defend most of their movies, but this is one I will kind of defend, but even I'm going to be like, yeah, this is not one of their best films. Like it's definitely in my lower six thirty one animated movies. This, when you make 62 animated movies, not everyone's going to be a winner. And yeah, this is unfortunately in the lower half compared to you know their cream of the crop yeah and you know it's it's kind of funny too because i actually thought this would be better than elemental actually i thought this would be like the superior movie of the year but it actually was the other way around yeah it was um i mean again like i love a lot of the disney animated stuff too like i recently earlier this year i bought like a bunch of the classic 90s movies and even like some of the early 2000s stuff as well like uh yeah. Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast and Lion King on 4k I also bought Treasure Planet on blu-ray and then I bought Lilo and Stitch on uh, the same format because I love oh these yeah movies. I really like yeah I really like Treasure Planet and Lilo and Stitch I, yeah. I, I Lilo and, I mean Lilo and Stitch was a late one I saw that when I teen years I didn't see Treasure Planet until I was like 20 and I really was surprised by that I was like why wasn't this well liked back in the day this is really good and i love treasure plan personally i think it's one of my favorite yeah it's it's like i might be in my top 10 favorite disney animated films actually of their studio i think it's like um one of john musker and ron clemens best movies actually really yeah yeah i, I, I really can, love it it's my probably my second favorite i think aladdin is the tighter movie but there's so much stuff i love in treasure planet like it's such a well-crafted movie and uh really gripping story as well i think for the most part a lot of fun and creative stuff as well Mm -hmm. yeah and yeah i can yeah i it's not one of i i I really like treasure planet i I don't know if i put it as one of my absolute favorites for them but i could i really do see the appeal of that movie i can i I totally get what you can consider it a top two they're one of their top three films top two and i can see why this isn't your top 10 because it's it's such a creative and interesting and also, just kind of cool movie. I really, really was surprised by it. I and and it bombed horribly because uh, they yeah, gave it, it bombed, no marketing. Yeah, they gave it no marketing. Kind of like Strange World. But <laughs> I digress. Uh, I still think Lilo and Stitch is like the better movie that year, but like that's like yeah, comparing like a filet, a filet mignon to a New York strip. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like compa- or even when it looks at or even when I look at the other Dubois Sanders film, it's like comparing How to Train Your Dragon to Megamind, you know. Megamind's good, but it's not How to Train Your Dragon. Mm-hmm. Uh but 
uh, yeah, I, I I do agree. Lilo and Stitch is the better movie. I, I I love Lilo and Stitch. That movie's a masterpiece in my eyes. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, Elemental so, was the better movie. But you know what I think is Elemental actually, was the better movie. But you know what's yeah. actually the best Disney movie that came out this year, animated one, was actually Nimona. It's the one they didn't put out. The one they didn't the put they out didn't... exactly. Nimona. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, full disclosure, I. Uh, to those that don't know, I adored Nimona. That movie meant so much to me. It is so good, and I really like it. Yeah, it's really, really good. I can. It's really, really good. I that one really hit hard for me, and the fact that it, it really is saying a lot that this movie was able to get rescued because this could have been seen as another tax write off. It could have gone down the Batgirl coyote versus acne thing but it got out and it's there and yeah I, I I completely agree I loved Elemental I think it's really I think it's great and I even kind of and I, I liked Wish even though I am disappointed in it but yeah you are completely right Nimona is the best movie that would have come out from Disney even though they didn't put it out <laughs> yeah it was only Netflix or like Annapurna that like picked it Annapurna, up I give Annapurna all the credit Netflix does not get yeah the, but they would have axed it uh if it you know probably if it came out like a year after yeah I, it, 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 Netflix just distributed it that's all I say yeah. that's all I'm saying it's an Annapurna movie um yeah I mean so well I was gonna say like yeah we were talking about the box office and like its effects on Disney but you know, it's it's funny because like this year Disney has been doing so poorly altogether at the box office. Like nearly every single one of their movies has been a disappointment. Like, like I guess with with the exception of like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three, which made over eight hundred mm -hmm. million. <coughs> Sorry, you have like the Little Mermaid, the Little Mermaid underperformed. Ant Man Three underperformed. Indiana Jones bombed. Marvels bombed. Wish most likely bombs like you have like all these like nearly all of their movies have just been a complete whether or not a disaster just made a massive disappointment financially yeah yeah i think it just has to do with the fact that I, I i just i think there's a lot of culprits that come into play there's not a specific reason why all these movies flop except for maybe marvel's and i, I except except for maybe Quantum Mania and Wish. I guess Wish Elemental was a modest hit. Um, Elemental I was a modest hit. That was a sleeper hit compared yeah. to. Yeah, it was it's like actually Guardians surprising. 3... It did better than most of their other movies this year. Actually, it's kind yeah, of. Yeah, I, I was not. Ex yeah, I was really shocked that Elemental beat the new Indiana Jones movie, but and the Flash as well. I, but thank God, I, I, I'm not. I'm not surprised to beat the Flash. I, I I saw my. I I don't know if I told you this. I saw when I saw Across the Spider Verse. I saw it with uh, my best friend when I went to visit her and uh, we got out of that movie theater. Uh, we had a trailer before the flash before that movie started. And I heard people just muttering, Oh, this is going to suck. <laughs> and then I, I remember, I remember walking to the car with her and I looked at her and I said, as we were driving back, this made the flash spider verse made this made the flash look like an amateur film i am telling you now that i've seen across the spider-verse the flash is absolutely going to bomb and even i was shocked at how badly it bombs like i knew for a fact it was going to do badly after seeing spider-verse because i was like there is no way in hell that people are going to see the flash over this and thank god they did and even yeah they didn't um a flash yeah. awful movie one of what one of my least favorites i think yeah, I have not seen it. It is on my blacklist. I have seen parts of it. It looks heinous. The I, only I'm part shocked. you need to see is the part with the baby in the microwave. Other than that, you're good. <laughs> yeah, I... Oh, gosh. It's just... Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, getting back to what you were saying about Disney's box office stuff, I think it's just the fact that it's not just Disney that's the problem. You look at all the other movies that have come out this year... Most it's of them have not been doing well. No, no, they haven't. I think it's just the fact that audiences are expecting better. And I feel that when I look at the two biggest movies of the year, and that was Bar the Barbenheimer, Barbie and Oppenheimer, and the reason why for both of those is simple. It's not because they were IP movies 
I mean, yeah, Barbie was an IP movie, but it was because the fact that they were coming from Oscar-nominated directors. You got Greta Gerwig making Barbie, and you got actors like Margot Robbie Ryan and Ryan Gosling making it. And you got Christopher Nolan directing this big, prestigious three-hour drama about the development of the atom bomb, which is amazing that this movie became in a billion dollar, an almost a billion dollar hit because this oh, yeah. is absolutely like the kind of Christmas movie you would, a movie that would come out in the Christmas time and would get. Oh, you're absolutely right. Maybe, maybe like I don't know, a hundred million, maybe one hundred fifty million at best. It would probably become like and, a Babylon, like where that, like where like uh like it has a big uh director behind it, all these great stars, but then it just kind of like is kind of an empty theater though. Yeah. Babylon uh, Babylon was badly marketed by Paramount, though. That's kind of why that movie flopped. And um, I love Babylon, for the record. That movie's, that movie's great. Uh, but, yeah, when I look at it now, it's just that audiences are getting tired of the films that I feel like Hollywood is coming out. And that's especially the case with the superhero movies, minus Guardians Volume 3, Spider-Verse, and even Mutant Mayhem. I would, call that, I would throw that as a superhero movie. Because... Um, Every single one of them has been a box office disaster. I, I mean, I, I mean, it, it, or it, if not a disaster, just a disappointment in the case of, say, Blue Beetle. But um, I, I, I just think audiences want better. You know, they exactly. want to see quality entertainment, and they and, and they're tired of all these big franchises getting revived because. Really, you're not bringing anything new to the table. I have not seen that new Exorcist movie that came out last month. One of my friends saw it. He hated it. Oh, my God. You should have seen how angry he was when he was talking about it. And apparently Universal wants to make this a trilogy. They spent $400 million million for those rights. Not $100 million. $400 on the rights. And I just keep thinking to myself, are you really going to keep making this trilogy when your movie hasn't even cracked maybe 200 million or 300 million? Like, and your movie is getting horribly panned by the critics. I, you can't keep doing that. I, I don't know what's going, I, I really don't know what next year's box office is going to be like, especially for animation. Cause animation this year has been strange box office wise. Like, yeah, you got the Mario movie, which was a huge hit. You got Spider-Verse did becoming well. a spider man yeah, Across the Spider-Verse did very well. Mutant Mayhem did well. Um, but Wish yeah. is like, uh, wah, wah, wah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, not as bad as Ruby Gilman, but still. Yeah. Not, I, mean, I, mean, I don't Ruby... think it's as, fl- it's not as flopping as much as like Strange World did last year, but like, it's not, yeah, it's not I, much I think... better, I don't think. Like, maybe, no, maybe, it'll, maybe it'll be like 100 million more or something like that, but. Yeah, Strange World didn't even make 75 million worldwide yeah. that if you want that's that is terrible for a movie like this and uh when i think back on this movie i keep thinking to my, when i think back on how wish will do it, it is i do, i do not think it's going to be a, it, it, i hate saying this it's not going to turn a profit but um what do you what do you think like uh audiences just weren't interested in seeing it on, on opening weekend either like the opening week was actually beat by napoleon surprisingly and even that like the Hunger i think Games it's movie? Be- i think it's if you want to ask me why i think it was because of the bad word of mouth um i got an a minus cinema score though i guess that's i, it, I got an a minus yeah but I, I i i i don't take cinema scores seriously i mean these are cinema score their cinema score gave a plus movies to like conservative films like hillary's america and whatnot Oh really? So, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't I do not put any stock in cinema score whatsoever. And uh I, I I just think that this movie I think there was a lot of hype going into it, but I do think that this movie's word of mouth started to get out and people were like it's actually not as good as people were making it out to be compared to Elemental because people were worried about Elemental and then people saw it and like, Yeah, this is great, you should yeah, see it. And uh, that was good. what kept building it up and where it with Wish it's like Eh, I don't know, which is like... It's not good. Yeah. It's either it's not good or it's like, eh, it's not worth it, honestly. And... Or it's just like a wait, hate... wait for it on Disney Plus sort of thing. That's the thing. It's like, you have no you have no idea how many times, like, 
I'll hear like uh, someone knowing about a movie coming out and like I'll hear, well, I'll wait till it's on Netflix or I'll wait till it's on Max, you know, something like that. Even even yeah. that new Miyazaki movie, like I remember I told you that there was a huge line for it. And I and one of my classmates like said, it's OK, I'll, uh, I won't see it today, but I'll see it when it's on Netflix. But like, what? How do you know it's going to be on there, though? Yeah, I mean, ugh, I yeah, I I also don't know why you wouldn't wa- wouldn't want to watch a Hayao Miyazaki movie on the big screen. I mean, I I've never seen a Ghibli movie on the big screen. This is going to be my first. I'm so hyped for it. For the record, yeah. I, I you've seen it. Apparently, you've seen it. I, you gave it a four stars on Letterboxd. Yeah, and um, yeah, I don't know how I'm. I, I'm very curious how I'm going to feel about it. I have. I've been trying to avoid a lot of it as much as possible. I've been going into it the same way that Japan released it because it had that mysterious poster, and that was it. There was no trailers. There was no screenshots. There was no. There was not even a plot synopsis. We didn't know what it was until the movie That's came a pretty good out. Marketing campaign because, like, if it's a, I, all I want to know about it is it's a Miyazaki movie. Yeah, and that's what they did essentially. That's what they did. They thought, well, it's Miyazaki. And this man directed one of the biggest movies in Japanese history, Spirited Away. This was the biggest film in Japanese history until your name about 14 years later. I mean, 15 years later, excuse me. I forgot Spirited Away coming out in 2001. And, uh, yeah, I, I feel like there's just a lot more. I feel like with that and also there's other animated films coming out later this year that I'm are curious about. There's obviously the second chicken run coming out on netflix um i'm i'm actually really excited for illumination's next movie migration it's from the director of ernest and celestine oh, yeah. which was a french animated movie and he also directed big bad fox that was also very good i'm really looking forward to it um and yeah when it comes to wish i think the reason audiences just didn't want to see it is because the word of mouth just wasn't that good enough to really hold people over and maybe the marketing as well maybe just didn't make didn't make it i know some people said that it just didn't it just didn't look interesting from the trailers though it looked derivative and i guess i can kind yeah, of see the marketing that. could be enough um, yeah i can kind of see that too because elemental ha- i mean elemental's marketing was a problem let's oh yeah let's that, that, i think the marketing yeah. for elemental was worse though i agree i agree because that movie did not look what interesting at all from the trailers yeah uh, it, it did not market the I I remember I was, I think by the time the Blu-ray came out, there was a DVD trailer that they made. And it's actually way better than the theatrical trailer because it it shows what the movie is. Yes, it actually shows Ember's struggle struggle with being raised in this environment and with the shop struggles and the fact that her parents are immigrants. Yeah, the DVD trailer is better than the theatrical trailer, which is so strange. I've never seen anything like that. Honestly, I think that the the best way you can market the movie is if you took like the first like five minutes of the movie with like Ember's parents immigrating to like the the big city and like you're seeing a bunch of the shots and stuff like that. Because I think the opening of the movie is very strong, actually. And I think that if you just took that opening and just made that the teaser trailer, I think that uh, more people would go like, oh, OK, it's interesting. I think you could do that with a lot of movies. Yeah. I mean, they did that for the Lion I, King back in the day. Yeah, I was gonna say that the 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 whole circle of life number that was the way they marketed that movie, and it worked. I mean, that movie became one of the biggest movies of all time at the time. I mean, it made nine hundred million dollars, and it's funny because I think I, I think this is common knowledge at this point, but. Disney was not that confident in The Lion King at the first. They thought, they thought Pocahontas, Pocahontas was, was going to be do better. Yeah, which is which is insane to think about. Um, but I, yeah, honestly, I, I think I, I, I think I like Wish better than Pocahontas. I think I know that for sure. I, I, I do too. I like Wish better than Pocahontas. Um, That's because I don't like Pocahontas really at all. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of there's elements of Pocahontas I kind of like, but I do agree Wish is the better movie. Yeah. Um. But, but yeah, wish, wish. Uh, well, I wish would, it was, was a little bit better. Would you recommend it though? <laughs> uh, if you're curious, yeah, it's worth a watch. I don't know. I don't know if it's worth. It, I'd say matinee at best. Theater price. 
Definitely not full price, though. I don't think this is a full price movie. Yeah, I went to the Tuesday one because, like, it was, like, $7 a ticket. I know that, like, the regular price, though, for, like, Sunday and Monday, like, it's, like, $16 or something like that. Like, that's insane. Like, I'm not... Yeah, that is insane. Yeah, but, I can't yeah. I can't pay that when I'm seeing Wish. But, like, I'm fine with, like, a, a, sh- a shorter price. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh. So, yeah... It... So yeah, my final verdict with Wish is if you are a big Disney fan and you are a little bit curious, I recommend it. You'll have fun with it. If you have no interest in this movie, though, and you think it, it, you are going to find it really boring and generic, then yeah, you can skip it. Yeah, my um, verdict would be meh. Yeah. It's all right. I think, <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's, yeah, that's about right. Like, like, uh, I'm not trashing it like other people are because I'm trying to, I'm trying to be as like, you know, uh, I'm trying to be as constructive as possible with it because I don't want to be like, uh, Disney sucks and Wish sucks. Uh. Yeah, I, I, I really am sick of that too because I want to go into everything with an open mind, you know, and... And I wanted to love again, this movie I, actually, but like, I was just like, okay. Yeah, it's it's a disappointment, yeah. I liked it more than you, but I can't deny it's a disappointment. Um, All I'm asking for is whatever Walt Disney Animation Studios does next. I hope it's good. I hope it's great. I hope it's hand-drawn. Well, it doesn't have to be hand-drawn, but, like, uh, if he could get to hand-drawn eventually, but if he could get to hand-drawn eventually, that would be cool. I mean, I would love to see a hand-drawn movie, too. If they announce a hand-drawn movie, I'll scream. But uh, uh, I guess we'll see what happens. Um, Wish. I wish it was a little bit better, but it's fine. So um, Eh. I know you said that your, your, your feelings towards it has kind of, like, soured just a little bit on it but your rating has still remained the same has there been any movies for you that have gotten worse or better for you uh over time that uh you know ever since you reviewed them because i know that you've reviewed movies since Mm -hmm. like all the way back in like 2016 has there been any movies in particular that you have changed your opinion on significantly whether it's like uh it's got it's gotten worse or maybe even better Yes, there actually have been. Uh, one of the biggest ones was The Breadwinner by Cartoon Saloon. Because I did not like that movie when I first saw it, and then I rewatched it, and I was like, I, I, I'm a stupid idiot. This movie's great. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's been a few movies that I've definitely soured on a little, and or either warmed up to. I've kind of warmed up a bit more on Storks, the Warner Brothers movie. Um, yeah, that one. Yeah, that one's a little bit. That one's actually a little bit better than I remember it being uh another one that i've really i'm trying to think of others that i've really grown to love more uh one big one that i loved it at the time and i've really grown to love it even more is howl's moving castle oh yeah uh that's a big one I only yeah saw, yeah i only saw it one time but i think it was like the english dub so like it probably wasn't the best way to watch it i think both are, i think the english dubs are pretty solid i mean they're produced by I mean, a lot of, I mean, they got good name actors. It's G-Kids or Disney when they were directed. The Howl's Moving Dub Castle was actually directed by Pete Doctor, believe it or not. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, speaking of Pixar, I, I I have soured a bit on Lightyear. That's another one. Yeah. I'm not as I've, fondly. I've, uh, I've, I think that's my least favorite of, like, the recent stuff. I actually really I like Yeah, movie. I'm with you, too. I, I, I am with you. That's not my, that's 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 their weakest film this decade so far yeah like, um, i was like meh on it when i first saw it but like thinking about it over time i like it less and less yeah um i still like it but i definitely like it a lot less than i saw it uh last year um I'm trying to think of what are other movies that i saw i mean there's other live action i mean there's live action movies i saw that i changed my opinion on but i like um, uh, animation i like puss in boots and uh Nimona when i first saw them but i like them more when i rewatched them though like they definitely went up uh there yeah Nimona's always i, I yeah Nimona's grown a lot more with me since i've seen it um like the first time i saw puss and boots the last wish i was like oh this is a solid movie the second time i watched it i was like damn they really cooked <laughs> yeah i need to rewatch it uh i i do think it was great though i really loved it um great movie i don't know i didn't adore it as much as other people did personally speaking i kind of like when it comes to the dreamers movies of 2022 i preferred the bad guys but Ooh, um i know Yin's, yeah i know my friend yin said is right up there with, there with you but i think that's because he's a big shark fan mm, yeah i 
I just love the bad guys because I saw that movie on a really, really bad day. I had a horrible day. I, I, I had a really horrible day and I was in this terrible thing and I went to see this movie and I was like, oh, maybe this will turn it around. Got out of it. I'm like, yeah, that just made my whole day. That was amazing. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, had, I had that happen with me uh, for Coco, actually. I remember I had a really, like, crappy weekend, but then I saw that movie, I was like, wow, this is really good. Oh, uh, Coco, such a good movie. Um, yeah, that that movie I, that movie came out when I was first starting a review. 2017, oh, Lord, that was one of the worst animated years I've ever covered. That was a bad year. People forget that. That was a bad year bad year oh yeah for it was stuff. so bad that the the academy awards nominated boss baby that year i mean yeah it's, i mean the thing that is i mean even putting aside the mainstream even putting aside that there were indie films they could have picked like silent voice they could have picked it over i mean lego batman or captain underpants were right yeah those there, were better you know? yeah i guess the academy yeah. just really doesn't like uh lego movies i guess like the I think I think it was because DreamWorks was really pushing for it, which eh, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. I don't get it. Was better, sometimes. way better actually. It was, yeah, it was, it was way better, yeah. Um, any, but any, anything else you have to say? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I I'll just say this: I'm so glad I had fun. I really like talking about both of these movies and oh yeah you you yeah. went into great detail about them like uh like i was just kind of sitting here like wow you have so much to say like like uh, you should be on podcast more often honestly yeah because you have a lot, <laughs> a lot to say about like movies yeah i i love to be back on and this was this was great yeah thank you so much uh so since you have a you, know, you have a youtube channel letterbox and that kind of stuff why don't you shout out your socials yeah uh if you want to follow yeah, I I, uh, I am still on Twitter. I refuse to call it X because screw muskrat. Um, yeah, I'm still on Twitter if you want to follow me. I do have a Facebook page if you want to see my uh, YouTube videos. I don't post on it very much. Uh, but I, I, I'm mostly on Twitter. I obviously update my YouTube page. And, I'm on, and I am on Letterboxd. I'm currently watching a lot more foreign animated movies. Yesterday I saw Mary and Max. Really loved that movie. I still uh, haven't seen that. Great movie. It's directed by Adam Elliott. It stars Philly, it stars uh, Tony Hoffman, Collette, the late I Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah. Really, really good movie. Really good. I highly recommend Mary and Max. Um, I'll definitely get to that sometime. Yeah, but if anyone wants to see me uh, talk about animation, just want to hear some positive, just hear me talk about positive things, talk about how terrible Hollywood is, and also uh, just... Uh, hear my thoughts on overall movies just check me out on twitter or um youtube letterbox i also do have a blue sky account i don't use it yet though yeah um yeah thank you so much for being on like this was awesome yeah no problem yeah so uh for you viewers if you like this video like the video and if you want to subscribe try subscribing and if you want to follow me in the letterbox follow me in the letterbox see you guys later on the next lazy joe show bye guys We'll